within the womb of that particular crisis that we're confronted with. I don't want to say to you, poverty has got color. I don't want to say to you, inequality has got color. I don't want to say to you, underdevelopment has got a color. But I would want to say to you, as you engage on this workshop today, you must understand the significance and the importance of this initiative, not just as a gesture of the presidency in bringing only the workforce into the sector to intervene wherein the, the sector itself has been unable to live to the expectations of the dynamics of the sector itself. Yabona ke xa ufika phe mpuma koloni ibangathi singabantu abanenkenxe exa sisithi Apha empuma koloni whether you approach the post provisioning norm in whatever form and shape you want to you will never stabilize the institutions of learning in this province unless a particular discourse of thinking is being applied. You'll never. Precisely because of the skewed, structured, systemic and pandemic policies that we have adopted in the country. The one size fits all. So, uba generic and not be scientific in approaching certain elements so that you can be able to have some elevations on how to deal with some of these questions. So I'm raising this question not just as just a component of the workforce that we have, but as an element, an intervention on the second economy that is confronting the province. The last time I was looking into the state's program director, we were at 37% unemployed youth in the province. And once you have got 37 unemployed youth in the province, you must understand that that's a ticking bomb. You have got a battalion of energetic people who are being rendered useless by the structured economy that we have. And hence, from time to time, you are required to up the game in terms of strategic thinking and advancement of and consolidation of the people's uh, economy in the province. So, we may not have time to, 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 to dwell much on how the sector, as a bigger department in the provincial government space, must respond to some of the challenges that are confronted by other sector departments. Because 45% of the budget of this government comes to this house. So once this house is not clearer about what must happen in the provincial government space, there is a crisis. You must understand it today. You may not feel being honored, being taken serious by the society. The sector itself is repositioning itself, bringing back the value that it has then. But I can tell you now, once education in any developing country gets confused, the entire nation is going to be confused. The pattern of development in any country comes from the thesis of this particular set. You will never get the NDP if that NDP is not a built-up program here. The architects you are talking about that you need in the NDP must be in a classroom here, now, not tomorrow. Now, not tomorrow. So I'm saying, 
when you deal with the dynamics, the science of, and the pedagogy of this sector, you must understand it as overlapping beyond other sectors and intervening in other weaknesses that other sectors are confronted with. The case at point, in the recent um, weeks, um, program director, we were called. We were called by the South African Human Rights Commission. And part of the questions that they raised to us, they could not believe when I'm saying, you are speaking of the manifestations, not the actual causes. When you say our kids, for example, are crossing rivers, who must build the bridges and the roads? So stop using kids to address the unaddressed issues. Because education, whose function is not belonging here. We don't build roads here. We don't build bridges here. We, work, we, we walk and travel on roads that has already been established by another ministry, not this one. So I'm saying, it's a matter that you must understand how society goes in and out, but converge in education. You build a school without roads, that school is useless. You advance on digital education, and another department fails to connect public and government entities. You are, you are, you are gone. That's not a responsibility to connect schools. Another department must do that for you. So I'm saying, in whatever strategies that you, uh, you, you employ, you must understand how crucial you are and how should from time to time not fail in appreciating that once you lower the guards as a sector, you run a risk of a stalemate in the development that we are confronted with that we must move with speed and ensure that there are certain elements that could be addressed. The program, the program that has been born, unfortunately, out of the pandemic that we had, that's the unfortunate part of it. While you are confronted with the pandemic on the other side, but the pandemic has brought in some positive spin-offs for us. Chris, we are able now to have got a battalion of young people in our schools that are employed to do the administrative functions that are required in the institutions of learning. And I can bet my last cent we will have not done that via the PPL. That one is out. Would have failed dismally, not done that via the PPL. Hence, I'm saying, whilst, whilst COVID-19 has been devastative enough, but it has brought some lessons for government in general and also for the sector in particular. Dinamkelake Apakule workshop with the intentions of, ensu of ensuring that let's find a way of consolidating our work, be more focused, avoid extremism at all costs, try to be scientific because this is a scientific exercise. Education is scientific in nature. So avoid to, to be taken away from the, from the trust of what is expected of us. We are beginning to be a beacon of hope now in the country in terms of strategic thinking and advancement of the school of thought that is required in the sector in general. Singana zokimpazamo esizenzileyo in ensuring that we implement some of the policy directives that are required. But I can assure you 
The minister was here last month, and she confessed that it is only now that we are beginning to learn number of issues that the country has been undermining from the province. And that tells you that we just needed to touch each other's hand, steer the ship, and ensure that nothing that comes in between the basic education in the country and also in provinces, in ensuring that we live to the expectations of those that rely solely on the interventions of government. By, by virtue of being an education as a sector, because there is no household that does not have a kid that is undergoing basic education. And there is no village in this country that does not have a school. So as is the Zotines Department of Naguambe, 50 kilometers away office in Gozo, Uzuiboni Department. It department is lapa nga paga ate bantuin. That's why kuba, kuba, kuba lule bantuin. Kuba kabe kaba nangazo, nantoni naba kaba nangazo. Bafun uchisiz gol. Bafun, because it's the only, only department that they relate with on day-to-day -day basis. That's how serious you are. That's how serious you are. So, when the city gang aloma as we program director, let's treat this initiative quite a bit serious. Understand this impact that it has in the communities that we are leading. Understand the leverage that it has brought into the institutions of learning. Understand the pressure that it has brought into the, so into, into the social economic conditions of our people that we are enrolling as part of the contingents of the workforce that we have. We will forever be indebted in any intervention that government seeks to give in ensuring that at least wonge umtu unayo into a basic yokupila obomi. Singa bina bantu abapila obunyubomi abanya bantu bepila obunyubomi in the same in the same country that they belong to. On behalf of the leadership and the management of the sector, we are looking forward to this third phase. We are looking forward into this program that Mong Amelia has brought to us. We are also looking forward to your good selves that you have steered the ship to be where it is now. We could have not got those results without you. Let me tell you up front. Results in education are in circuits, in districts, and in schools. That's how dynamic education is.
the program is now officially opened. This was just setting the tone by the Honorable MEC. Thank you so much, MEC. This was a mouthful. For the first session of this program, ladies and gentlemen, may I usher Ms. Dom Vusele Lofikeni, who will run the program henceforth. May Fikeni come forward, please. Thank you, Mr. Jack. Before I start to facilitate this session, there is a choir that is going to entertain us before. Can I please call the choir to come up front? Thank you. Ikwayara siya itela ize ngapambili. Can the choir come in front, please? Nancy Iquayara, colleagues, Masinga Bisang Mola. We are waiting for the choir. Come up front, please. It says Anjalo Iquayar and Zautela U. Um, mama, um, pepe said there's something she dropped. It's here with me.
Lord, please, for the choir. For those that are coming outside the Eastern Cape, we just wanted to showcase Ukuba, this is what we are made of. We wanted to say to the DPE team, welcome home. It's fine, you may not go back. Uh, thank you, thank you very much to the choir. Um, colleagues, I am observing the protocol that has been established being led by our Honorable MEC. Uh, before I proceed with the program, I just want to inform uh, uh, the participants that the bathroom facilities are right at the back of the venue. Uh, the ushers will assist uh, you colleagues if uh, you've got a confusion with that. I also want to take this opportunity to acknowledge uh, the participants and the visitors that are with us here today. Um, UMECG has welcomed everybody, that, but I think it's proper for me to make mention that we are honored Ukubakubeko Abant from the DPE, Ditela Itim from DPE, Ipaga Mesibone, and we can give them a round of applause. You can just stand up where you are, colleagues from DPE. That is not warm enough, colleagues. Eastern Cape Agukonjal. Thank you. That's better. That's better. Uh, colleagues, we've got. Um, okay, let me go to the districts before I come back to head office. Dzaukalanga pezanske mamponden. Itim from Alfred Nzo East. Uh, I believe the district director corner ati vumbunche na bantu ba kesi ba bon ba ba na ba bantu abasuganga pa yembizan. Alfred Nzo East. Hey, that is Alfred Nzo East. Alfred Nzo West. Yeah. That is the team from Alfred Nzo West. Joe Kabi. Masbat Kwabeleni colleagues are bound to because Natis is of Kwakel. O R Tambo Coastal. O R Tambo Coastal. Hey, Hindu Yonke. Hindu Yonke, O R Tambo Coastal. O R Tambo Inland. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Chris Ani East. Chris Ani East. Thank you, thank you, colleagues. Uh, Chris Annie West. Are you calling Chris Annie West? Thank you. Uh, Sarah Batman. There is Sarah Batman. Thank you. The host district, BCM. Thank you, BCM. Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela. Itani Nelson Mandela kwa kubu pagami PCM yangu abonagal. Amatole East. Amatole East. Yambonu mamuto lomu ya ikuazi timiaki. Amatole West. Thank you, colleagues. Those are the 12 districts that make up a, 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 a province, yes, the Eastern Cape in the Department of Education. Thank you, colleagues, for honoring uh, uh, the invitation. Uh, the team from head office, Ningagani Parliament, head office, Ndibon. Hey, I call head office up. Thank you, colleagues. Colleagues, we've got very important people. Uh, in our midst, our stakeholders, and this open the city, as in as in the stakeholders, as seven sanas in the Department of Education, Ziti Vumbunje. Thank you. 
Siabulela Gakulu. Colleagues, we've got a youth here too that has been appointed through this program. And I think it will be very beautiful if we can see our EAs, GSAs in our midst. This is your day. Abeko Nabaguit. Naba. Let's clap hands for the youth colleagues. colleagues, I hope I have not left anyone, but I just wanted us to understand who is here. Thank you, colleagues. Colleagues, as the program is uh, and I will be facilitating this session of our workshop. Uh, colleagues, we should know that this, this is a hybrid model of a workshop, so there are people that will be connecting to us uh, via a Microsoft Teams, and I hope our ICT team is ready to assist us with that. Uh, colleagues, it, is, it has already been alluded uh, during the opening and uh, Mr. Jack, when he was making his opening remarks, that we are here to do a, a, a review and plan going forward. What is it that we have done good? What have been the challenges? And how are we going to move forward? You will recall, dear colleagues, that in 2020, uh, COVID-19, that's when this program, a presidential initiative started, where we had to appoint 55,000 uh, youth into our schools. And I know you will attest to the fact that it was a very hectic program, appointing 50, 55,000 people over a very short period of time. Uh, the province of Eastern Cape, Kenayo, Department of Education, Kange uh, ifune uko yega inga that opportunity, and we did that successfully. Then we moved to phase two, when we had to appoint 40,000 once more. We also did that, and we are moving now to phase three. We are here again, colleagues, to check what is it that we've done. As I was saying again, this is a hybrid model. We are going to have our presenters. I hope Dr. Kate Phillips from the Office of the Presidency is ready, and I believe he is connecting virtually. Singatulake colleagues, I understand that we will be taking notes so that at the end of the session, there will be discussions and some engagements. Thank you. Uh, ICT team, let me hover, uh, hand over to Dr. Phillips. making this program the success that it has been. The school assistance program has been, has become really a flagship of the presidential employment stimulus and it's taken a huge amount of effort and commitment from so many people uh, across the country, nationally, in the provinces, um, school go governing bodies and really want to acknowledge and recognize the hard work that has happened. What I'm going to be doing here today is talking briefly about um, a, a few reflections on the, D, the DPE program, but I'm going to focus mainly on other programs in the stimulus um, to provide you with some insight into where the DPE program fits within the wider stimulus framework. So let's start briefly by looking at where we act with the stimulus as a whole. These are the outcomes to the end of January. Um, we're still finally collating the February figures. 
but we have delivered over the two phases of the program over 850,000 jobs and livelihood opportunities as part of the employment stimulus. And this just happened in what I'm sure you all recognize um, has been very time frames for delivery. Uh, the stimulus is broken down into three components. There's a job creation component, which your program is a part of. There's also programs that have supported livelihoods for people whose livelihoods have been disrupted by COVID. And in phase one, there was a co component of jobs retained, and DBE also had a component of job retention within the program. That element um, is no longer in phase two. It was very much part of um, the context of lockdown. So really, the program has delivered at quite remarkable scale quite quickly. 85% um, of beneficiaries have been youth and 63% have been female. Tactically, a big challenge in the employment stimulus has been the issue of scale. Our task was to design a mass employment program that could roll out very quickly in the context of the crisis. Now, of course, and the employment pre the crisis of unemployment predated COVID, but COVID certainly exacerbated it. And the issue of achieving scale has been a particular challenge. If you look at the figures here, I mean, DBE is actually off the charts of nearly 600,000 participants over the two phases. Um, the bar charts here don't even begin to reflect the, the differential in the scale of that program compared to other programs. And I think what has been quite sobering is how difficult um, government departments have found it to roll out program at significant scale. And what we've realized is that this is actually a critical capacity for a capable state, and that we really need to build the institutional architecture um, to deliver scale along with strong qualitative outcomes. Um, and what we have been doing over the, 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 the phases of this, the stimulus so far is actually trying to design for scale and to develop um, the opportunities to deliver at scale. The criteria for the stimulus um, involve all stakeholders in the value creation uh, from the programs in which most of the funds go to intensity is a critical feature and so, uh, the school assistance program scores very high investment in public employment path learning opportunities so that we're all going and the focus in the stimulus has been, this is a unique opportunity to test different approaches. What we want to see is additionality and innovation over and above what has been achieved previously through public employment programs. I'm not going to spend long on the PYEI DBE program, but it is an amazing success story. And along with scale has gone this will increase space equity. Often when we roll out employment programs, this is difficult to achieve. Community has schools. This program is able to reach every corner of the country, and that's been a real success. So has the fact that everyone in the school system has come to the party, and it really matters to us to see that, and to see also that the union have also come to the party and supported this program, and that's an important element. Again, what we see in this program is not just scale, not just spatial equity, but also that the quality of work experience has been strong in most instances, and the quality of social impact has also been strong. So you often have a one-to-one -one mentorship relationship with the teacher or participants, which is a really intensive uh, work experience relationship. At the same time, the feedback is that often 
the participants are really able to support teachers and that in turn is supporting learning. It's creating and strengthening um, the learning environment. All of these are important dimensions of the program. When we look at the employment stimulus, we also really want to highlight to the audience here the importance of stories, the importance of conveying more than just the numbers and conveying the social impact of what is happening. And the question to you is, how are you telling your stories of this program? If you go to our website, you'll see a number of beneficiary profiles, and these are just some of them. I'm going to highlight ones that are not from your program. So we have Wandila Monabati, um, who's the co-founder and executive producer at Colstow of Pictures, who says that COVID-19 was devastating. His company had to close down. He was a sole breadwinner. It was very difficult times. But through the stimulus to the creative sector, he got a grant, he was able to open up once more, and in fact, used the stimulus to produce the movie Rocket Boy, which is about a young African scientist. Then we have the Water Research Council through DSI, Department of Science and Innovation, who placed Bernal Peta in a research and development company specializing in water efficiency. She emphasizes the multifaceted nature of her job. She says, I've been involved in project planning phase, including site surveys, compiling bills of materials and bills of quantities, sourcing and acquiring materials and improving project reporting. This is meaningful work experience that she sees as supporting her goal of starting uh, her own business. Is, um, we need to tell the personal stories, we need to convey the impacts of these programs in order to motivate their significance as part of our policy mix and particularly if we want to see them extended. So I'm putting that challenge to you also. And we want to look at different dimensions of impact because these programs are multi -fitted. So there are impacts on participants, the impacts on the learners, on the school system, on teachers and principals, and impacts on the local also. So important as the relief element of these programs are in providing incomes into poor households, it goes further than that because the incomes earned are then spent in every local economy in the country, mostly in townships and rural economies. So critical input in supporting the recovery and growth and also the informal sector, which was hard hit by the pandemic. And this spending trickles up into the wider economy from there. So if somebody is buying this mini meal from a local spaza shop, they are supporting that spaza shop. But that purchase goes all the way up the value chains into the core economy and supports uh, jobs in the core economy as well. This is a really important part of the policy positioning of these programs. And yet we don't have a very strong evidence base for how this kind of spending really does support economic recovery throughout the economy. And that's why we're doing uh, research into this dimension. And one of the components of, of this research is uh, the Financial Diaries Initiative, which is in partnership with yourselves and is looking at the income impact on participants, requesting them to fill in a financial diary on how they spend and where they spend as part of building evidence base for showing that this kind of intervention uh, doesn't just affect direct participants, participants, it's actually trickling up into the entire economy and supporting jobs through this mechanism as well. So we really do active support and participation in this initiative um, because the evidence from it um, is very much part of our ability to motivate the importance um, of these programs going forward and their continuation. Now, these jobs are short Term. They are not sustainable jobs, obviously. Plan A is that the economy grows and creates sustainable jobs. But in a context of crisis like the present, these short-term jobs um, provide a really important role. But because they're short-term, it does mean we have to focus on exit strategies. Um, so even if the duration of the current placements is extended, these are still not permanent posts. They also shouldn't ever be seen as a substitute for those. That would not be a good outcome. So we need to use this opportunity to optimize participants' pathways into other opportunities, whether those opportunities are in the education system um, or beyond it. 
We know that DBE is playing a key role in thinking about this. It's not just DBE's responsibility. We need to involve the wider education sector, the private sector, and the wider system in taking on their pathways. And this is also where the involvement of SA youth becomes critical and has played a crucial role in supporting the early stages of the pathway management work and the SA youth platform. With hundreds of thousands of young people signing up on the because DPE has rooted through this mechanism. But I think it's important for you all to understand that the role of SA youth is key not only in the recruitment, but actually also in supporting people's pathways beyond the program when they exit. And that is when we're really going to see some of the value of having used SA youth because they are then able to support and handhold and channel youth towards other opportunities. I think it's also important to note that SA youth has also been supporting unsuccessful applicants. So yes, we have a cohort of people who've been successful and are being uh, and are earning through, the, through, through this program, but we also know that many young people did not get those opportunities. SA platform supporting them to other learning and earning opportunities. What I want to focus on now is some of the other programs in the stimulus to give you a tale of other challenges that are being experienced. So I'll focus on the parts. Particularly excited about is the Social Employment Fund. This has been launched as part of the social and solidarity economy uh, within the DTIC with Industrial Development Corporation as fund manager. It's, it is supporting the non-state sector to create 15 jobs, undertaking part-time work defined as work for the common books. What is meant by that? Why are these jobs part-time? A feature of this program is that the jobs are ongoing, so um, funding permitting, um, the jobs last, in phase three, they're going to last for at least a full year. Um, providing regular and predictable income to people. And what research is Uh, workshop participants, let me just inform you of what is happening. Um, I, I think Ngogu is COVID, Gufnega Ipele, because the network is new. That in some contexts, um, and you know, if, if, if full time employment in the economy is, 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 is not on the table, is not an option. But there are real advantages to people getting a regular and predictable income for a longer period of time. But that assists.
thing to undertake complementary learning activities or complementary livelihood activities, building up their own income generating capacity in parallel to their participation in regular and, and, and predictable work. I think this quote from the president is important in understanding the strategy of social employment. He said that we are working on the premise that there is no shortage of work to be done to address the many classes. Our aim with this program is to build considerable creativities that exist in a wider society to engage people that serves the common good. What do we mean as the common good? Really, it's a wide spectrum of issues. But the point is that really we want communities to play a critical role in defining what this means and what they see as the common good. But the kinds of programs that are being supported are things like placemaking, converting, uh, converting unused public spaces into safe spaces, community security and nutrition, art, drama and sport, community and public art, informal settlement upgrading. So just some examples of the kinds of things that are included in the definition of work for the common good. Now, I mentioned earlier our challenge in designing for scale and achieving scale. We are particularly excited that we have just completed the first call for proposals for the Social Employment Fund. And this is an experimental program, so we have had to prove the concept, and so it started at a target scale of 50,000 participants. But what has been amazing is that in that first call for proposals, the value of applications that met the minimum qualifying criteria for the fund, uh, which were a value of over 10 billion, um, which could have 300,000 part-time jobs for a year. So this program has already demonstrated a proof of concept for going to scale in a new way, um, partnering with the non-state sector to deliver jobs at scale that are initiated and run in communities and in partnership with non-state actors. Its current status is that in fact the final contracting is happening this very week and we will be in a position to announce um, who has been successful uh, from the non-state sector and what the composition of those 50,000 jobs will be. But I think this is an important example of how over the course of the minutes, we have been building this institutional architecture to go to greater scale. Um, so that's an important program. I think many of you are also familiar with the, the Presidential Youth Employment Intervention Programs. The PYEI is a specific unit within, within the PMO and the presidency that has its own particular programs. Its flagship program is the Pathway Management Network, um, and you will be hearing more about that from Lerato later today, I believe. So I'm going to go into detail on that, but rather highlight what the agriculture sector has been doing. So Dalrad has been issuing production input vouchers for subsistence farmers. Over 100,000 vouchers have been issued, uh, 67,000 vouchers. And what has been exciting about this program is that the short time frames involved, Dalrad was forced in a way <laughs> to, to, uh, to innovate technologically to get the word out. And they used a USSD platform on mobile phones, including feature phones that are not smartphones, so that subsistence farmers could apply for the production input vouchers using their phones. There was a lot of anxiety initially that this would not be accessible to subsistence farmers. Um, but in fact, quite the reverse proved to be the case. 178,000 subsistence farmers applied on the platform, um, giving Delred a spatially referenced um, a, a, a database, um, a, a, a geolocated da database of subsistence farmers for the very first time. This is a huge resource now for ongoing support to subsistence farmers to help them build pathways out of poverty with a lot of data associated with the database in terms of the kinds of production that people are engaged in. They have faced same problems with suppliers that actually sustain their program because they found that suppliers from the private sector were abusing this program and taking a big tax of the hardship. So that the subsistence farmers are not getting the full value. But this has had a technical 
important. program in Treasury, and all metros had to bid with proposals for innovative proposals for high quality public employment. And we've had some fantastic proposals come in and be approved um, and are now in implementation from 1st of February. These include things like support to homeless people through public employment, where homeless people are being offered the opportunity to participate in public employment in this instance. Apologies to the workshop participants. Uh, these presentations have been pre-recorded, but it is clear that there is a network challenge within the venue. Uh, we apologize for that, but we will make the presentations available to all the participants uh, electronically. If you had listened to it before the, 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 the network uh, was worse, you could see that is a very important information for us to have just as citizens of this country. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, be that as it may, get colleagues, let us give a round of applause to Dr. Phillips. Otherwise, the presentation will be sent to us all. And we will quickly get colleagues, I am hoping and praying that we get a clearer version of the presentation now. We will move on to Dr. Mabohwana. Dr. Mabohwana is going to be talking to e monitoring and evaluation and the roles of all the layers that were actively involved in the presidential initiative, starting from the DBE, provincial departments, uh, district up to the circuit. Colleagues, for us to honor Lendo Sizeguyo. Noguba gukom to ume apanga gapambili. Siti kuaganje si pula pule. We take notes. Uguze sasba esizotini up. Please, din din diani bongos. ICT team, please let us get the next presentation. Situ lenjalo colleagues, please. Diakela band. And if I'm at you, we are more like and slowly pair pants. This is our paramisel pep. Are you winning, colleagues? We are born again, like we are babies. Do not up. Can sit in my each one book. We have out at the bat in the attire tagging book. See us, my colleagues. See us. A dashboard and a little bit more around them at the map approach that we are advocating. So for everyone who's here, I know that we know that it's important that when we plan, we are also ensure that we think around the evaluation and we also think around monitoring. And this creates a virtuous cycle that if these three things work together, we are able to see programs being implemented, but we are also able to see the uh, programs being able to uh, remove all the obstacles that they, they may be uh, uh, encountered. So this is because the results-based monitoring is just providing continuous.
continuous process of collecting and analyzing information to compare how well a project is going and then also to achieve the results and the outcomes that we are interested in. And that is a continuous thing. You don't plan once and then and stop planning. You don't evaluate once and stop evaluating. And you don't monitor once and then stop monitoring more monitoring. So it's not an event, but it's a continuous process that we get involved in. And this is what ensures that projects and programs get implemented successfully. And why do we do monitoring? We do monitoring for three reasons. One, we want to account for public funds against their grid targets. Money has been entrusted and we need to be able to deliver and therefore we need to achieve targets that we have set for ourselves. Similarly, in addition, monitoring is not just punishment or finding fault, but it is formative in, in nature to enable us to solve problems that are preventing service delivery or that are preventing programs from being implemented the way they're supposed to be implemented. So it is also solution generation process. We monitor to be able to solve problems so that we can find solutions for those problems. And then third, to enable development uh, in, 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 in the way that uh, we work together as communities of practice, uh, sharing and reflecting on how we succeeded, how we unblocked where there are blockages by sharing and reflecting on, 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 on programs that we are dealing with. Then uh, every time when we monitor, there are things that we always continuously have to keep in mind uh, uh, and think about them. So it's, we need to say, are the planned activities being done? I mean, most of the time we, we plan things and then we leave them at the planning stage. But monitoring will ask a question, have we planned, is it being carried out? And then uh, are things being done right? It's not enough just to do things, but are they being the correct way? And there we want to always emphasize uh, three things, effectiveness, efficiency, and client satisfaction. While we just need an effective way of achieving the outcomes, uh, especially now with the, the budget constraints that we are operating uh, uh, under, we need to be able to stretch the range much and be able to achieve a lot with little. Being effective now an important thing. So always asking, when are we doing things in an effective way? And are we, is this the best method? Is it in an efficient way? And then lastly, the people who are involved, are they satisfied uh, with the program and the way it is being implemented? And then this requires us to be uh, uh, people who are of continuous because we want to always find alternatives we always want to find we also want to uh, learn lessons that we can apply in new programs and other programs or in a, a, a locality where this program is being uh, implemented to ensure that it becomes effective it becomes efficient and it's able to achieve the outcomes that we are interested in so saying that with monitoring we must move away from just only monitoring inputs, activities, and outputs. We want to say to now focus also on outcomes. And these are, this is a, 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 the, what we are not necessarily used to. We are used to with using our APPs, focusing on outputs, activities, and inputs. But we are saying now we also need to think of the outcomes and the impacts that we are heavy on this uh, by implementing these programs. So this means when you plan, you got to make sure that we are using appropriate tools for planning and that the, 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 the plans that we have, have are designed effectively and that we need to ensure that uh, uh, correctly for the resources that 
that means we need to know the limitation and we need uh, to, uh, to know how far we can go and uh, to do it in terms of our implementation of the plans that we have. Similarly, we need to also be thinking that when you end uh, these plans, we need to think on how we are going to be monitoring it. Not only monitoring uh, are being done, but performance. How are we performing? Are we operating at the, uh, at the high level, optimum level, or we are uh, uh, operating below the optimum uh, uh, level. And that means then we review, refine and, uh, uh, our programs and, and the plans that program and the plans improve them. And then we also then need to ensure that we uh, evaluate. And evaluation goes be, uh, beyond just evaluating at impact. You must evaluate at at design state, uh, uh, evaluate at uh, implementation state, also then at impact. And this is important because it's the information that you generate through this that we are able to make recommendations for improvement and we are able to make a, a, a recommendation that a decision maker can be able to use uh, uh, to correct that we are following and be able to say and can better our our um, our projects and this is important that decision makers are not only people at the but they are also people at the at at at, at, at code phase people who need to uh, continuously improve the programs they cannot improve the implementation if the information that is being gathered is not active uh, is not of quality and is not informative. Uh, we need to ensure that decisions that we make are informed and it's not just only gut feeling that we rely on. And we also then continue then to diagnose how we implement our program, whether the situations are changing, we need cause correction, and there are, what are the problems that we need to deal with to unblock blockages that are there, are there and then and, and then ensure that then intervention uh, are able to accelerate and implement the programs that we have service delivery improves and the developmental agenda of having this project are actually being achieved this is important also that we also remember that monitoring happens at two levels one at ground level where things are getting done but then also we uh, 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 monitoring is relevant also for policy makers and decision makers and planners and this is important to ensure that uh, uh, decisions and choices and cause corrections is done based on best available information so that we ensure that there is always an alignment between what we've planned and the budgets that are available and that we are able then to also leverage the partnerships that we need to have we cannot build partnerships if information is not available uh, if information does not uh, give uh, uh, partners the trust that what we are implementing actually will result in changes that we would like to, to see. So then uh, with information that comes, that's generated through monitoring, we are able to improve planning and performance. And then we also ensure that citizens are able to understand what are we really implementing and what changes it is having on, on, on society. So the presidential employment stimulus program uh, uh, is important because it does not only just give money, it tries to change people's lives and the way they view themselves. Work on its own has an impact uh, on people's lives. And uh, uh, so it's not just that they have the money, but we are saying by working, it changes their, it changes their lives because it provides structure to their lives. It increases access to networks that they would not have, networks with other people, networks with a, a, a new ways of doing things and people who are able to provide information and skills that they would not know about. And then it, it improves their capabilities and it provides information that sometimes if they're being at home, they would not be aware of. And it provides a respect 
and from the community for because of the work that they are doing and it provides also a sense of agency on the on the participants and this is because we are trying to create a, 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 a social, a social economic a, a, value. That is why we, uh, uh, this uh, presidential employment stimulus program is, is trying to do. We're providing money, but we are also saying there is an economic value that is being uh, uh, generated by participating in, in this. We create livelihoods, it provides social enterprise, and it provides pathways out of poverty, pathways into greater things for the participants that blocks uh, new forms of a community agency and initiative with cities. And then provides an outcome that are faced by this. So here we also have example of the you go to the a few things and which uh, is important the cause you your role in pro collect data is so important uh, you, you should uh, we should all take it as in terms of the quality of data that we collect and that with this data is always collected online and data uh, 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 we understand the, the source the sources of this this Calls it takes it takes long for, for to be analyzed and from impact that in, that information would have if uh, it was uh, collected quickly and it was analyzed and shows where the problems are and it also shows where the successes are and therefore we are encouraging that everyone in the whole value system. Uh, sees themselves as people who collect data from the school level in the classroom to the circuit to the district to the province and then to the nation uh, to, to national why do we collect this as we, we uh, 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 in, uh, as i've indicated before is that mel which is monitoring evaluation reflection and learning is that while we want to be accountable to, to funds, we also want to measure the multi-dimension of this program. And therefore, it has, uh, uh, MEL operates at, uh, at three levels. One, we want to account for public funds. This is what we usually do, we are used to it. But in, in addition, we, as I've indicated before, it provides development and F, uh, uh, it uses monitoring and evaluation to develop not only the program itself but also us as officials in terms of thinking about so and the challenges that 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 are there it provides also information for us to say using evidence base to reflect on what we are doing that we are not just ticking boxes but we are thinking about how to solve problems, how to deal with challenges that we are faced with. And then, as I say, it's if it allows, uh, um, uh, 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 it strengthens the outcomes that we are developing uh, so that we, we, we are thinking every time, how do we improve the outcomes of the, of the program? 
thirdly, uh, as I said, it provides evaluation of the social and economic outcomes and impacts. Now, this is beyond just compliance. We don't know, we are saying we are moving from just a ticking boxes to say we've done things, but to say how are we changing people's lives, how are we changing communities, and this is where we say we go, be, we, we, we use trends, we see linkages with other programs, other uh, uh, programs in the locality or being pro, uh, 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 created uh, or being implemented in different uh, localities. And it also allows us to say in that locality through geospatial analysis to say in that uh, uh, area, what are the challenges, what can we Lab and how, what are the solutions we are providing. And you solve problems, you learn, you adapt, and then you ultimately have an impact in society. And MEL also is able to, uh, uh, this approach is it able to uh, monitor and, and, and capture the multi-dimensional effects of this program because this program is multi-dimensional in the way uh, it's the, uh, uh, it affects people's lives and we want to capture all of it uh, in, 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 in all its essence. And then MEL also allows for multidisciplinary approaches to monitoring, multi uh, multidisciplinary approaches to evaluation so that we are able to extend our research agendas to go beyond qualitative, quantitative, but also to look for other things that traditionally we don't look at, at them. And then lastly, public accountability. It enables public engagement to say things are not only happening on the public, but the public is able to also provide uh, inputs, but not only provide inputs, but also to say, to indicate where things are not happening and provide a critique that is important to ensure that we continuously improve the performance of the program. So in, in this, uh, in closing, MEL provides us with ability to be accountable for public money. It, uh, uh, with, the, the, uh, with the data plans that we have, we are able to track indicators and then we are able to use different data types and use different sources of data that uh, usually we would not use, uh, uh, including how people experience uh, uh, the program. Uh, it is developmental in approach. It's not meant to punish anyone, but it is meant to open up uh, uh, our understanding of the programs and the differences that it's making on, on society. Secondly, it, uh, we want to account for the effects of the program on the participants. We want to know how it is changing them, how it's changing their lives, changing their view of life, changing their mental state, and then changing and giving them work experience that otherwise they would not get. And then with that work experience, where does it take them? And the self-worth that results from just being able to work and, 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 and the income and the skills that you build, uh, uh, we want to be able to account for that. And then the impact and the social value that it creates uh, as, they, uh, as they participate in, in the program. Lastly, the social attitude that it, uh, uh, that we want to be able to monitor. We want to monitor how participants change about the uh, the, the program, even the the, the, the recipients the, in the community. How does it change the way they view the program? How does it change them the way that they feel uh, uh, it's making a changes in in their in, in their lives? So in the uh, in conclusion, then I'm asking this question to all that we 
on this and we wish you good luck good man a round of applause once more colleagues please colleagues let us just clear Hands for the previous speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Come to the end of our first session. Uh, if you look into your programs, we were supposed to be having once a corner plan. Now we have also decided to defer the, the discussion and action session on this uh, session and we are going to combine it with the next session where we will also discuss and interact on the presentations that were made during this session. We can now break for tea. The time is 10.40. It's going to be, minutes, but I'm giving you two minutes more. We will 11 o'clock. Thank you, colleagues. Um, thank you.
colleagues, the time is one minute past 11. Can we please settle? Can we please settle, colleagues? Can we be settled, colleagues? Siya tela bantu bangen yenga pagati. Mamufuchane from Amatole West. At the back, can we please take our seats? Thank you. Can we get seated, please? Can we all get seated, please? Now we are getting to the second session where we are going to be reflecting on phase two achievements and challenges. We know that in each and every project, definitely there will be challenges. But our challenges do not surpass our achievements. Now, now we are going to DPE, Ms. Lala, to deal with the overview on the implementation of phase two including the training and expenditure, followed by Ms. Mr. Maponya and Mr. Lichodi, that is the DPE project team, and they are going to be followed by our DOE project team, led by U provincial team leader, Umamu Sidiya. Over to you, Mam Maje. Thank you so much.
Good morning, colleagues. Good morning, colleagues in the Eastern Cape. Uh, colleagues, we are very happy to be amongst yourselves, uh, those that have achieved in this um, noble project. I want to request what Kate have requested and uh, our technology did us um, something. Colleagues, I'm requesting that we clap for ourselves. We give ourselves a big round of applause just for the achievement that we have made, that we have, um, that we have achieved in terms of this initiative in the province. Colleagues, we know that this project is one of a kind, one that helps government to address three fundamental challenges. Uh, we know that we are dealing with inequality, we are dealing with issues of poverty, and colleagues, we are trying to ensure that with this initiative we are able to address uh, those. We are able to employ um, young people who are living with disability through this. So we are redressing past imbalances uh, using this initiative. Colleagues, um, as we are presenting today, um, the first part, I just want to talk to chiefs of the project, some context to where we come from. And then I will hand over to my two other colleagues to present in terms of what we have achieved in the numbers we have placed and also with regard to training since this project is mainly to capacitate our youth so that when they go out, out of our schools, they are able to fend for themselves and stand on their own feet. Um, colleagues, when we go into... Um, the context, we, I just want to um, mention that, I just want to mention that the initiative is placed at national, but we are seeing that it's not the only national project that is implemented to address unemployment. We are also seeing other programs such as EPW. We are seeing those that are working with infrastructure. And we are also seeing uh, other initiatives that are implemented at provincial level and others in the metros. Colleagues, we need to understand this context because we are working with young people who want this kind of thing, and once they know it, you'll, you'll be surprised that today you are with them in your school, and tomorrow they are saying, sorry, I'm going to the next one, because one is paying a little bit more. Remember, all of them come with their own framework. So it means young people will be going all out for this information, and if you, the implementer, are not aware of this, you'll find that some of them are even going towards that thing of double dipping. And we know that the back of government, uh, when it comes to money, uh, we don't have that much. Um, colleagues, the context when it comes to the issues around um, the young people that we are servicing, we are servicing young people that unemployment is rife in them, 66.5% um, in the entire country, and we've heard the MEC saying, for Eastern Cape, it's 37%. And colleagues, at the same time, we are also indicating to yourselves that that is the sector that was badly hurt by COVID. Remember, these are the young people who are in the sector of working in the restaurants, the hospitality, and when COVID hit, those are the people who had to go home because all these restaurants and hotels closed. Not only that, colleagues, uh, some of us are hiring them in our homes to assist us. 
But these young people could not do that anymore because we are at home and we are the ones now doing our own work in the house. So informal employment sector was badly affected. Uh, the semi-skilled um, sector was badly affected. And this um, initiative came at the right time just to ensure that uh, the young people are able to be catered for colleagues in terms of uh, this initiative. Colleagues, we are also, we went deeper to check these numbers that we have seen from Stats SA that are saying the young people are sitting at 66.6% of unemployment. And we are seeing that those with less metric Unemployment is high. It's at 40.2%. Those with metric, unemployment is sitting at 36.5%. Uh, let's remind ourselves, we take care of them for 12 years. We keep them in our schools for 12 years. When we talk of those with metric, uh, those are the young people that come out of our hands. Those that uh, completed metric, and we know in 2020, many of them did not proceed with their tertiary, um, with their tertiary education um, due to COVID. So colleagues, we have also contributed as a sector uh, to that number. So this initiative comes at the right time that we as a sector is able to say, let's look at our young people who, are at, uh, who have the, this metric, who don't have hope of receiving anything else or going beyond metric, that we are able to cater for them. The young people with a tertiary, um, who are still in tertiary, they are at 23.2%. Tertiary, it means they are studying they are doing something, and those who are graduates are seeing a 12.5%, those who have completed um, their qualifications. Um, yeah, there's a network problem, colleagues. Apologies about this. This is not helping. Please help me. Hmm? Okay, colleagues, whilst we are still waiting for connectivity, because we are now cut, uh, we have also gone out to look at, we have also gone out to look at, um, we are servicing to say that um, when we implement this initiative, look into um, being efficient by implementing using ICT. So remember when we came, we said we want to use um, SA Youth Mobi because we had only one week to appoint them and place them in our schools. The world said, no, you will never make it. The country said, no, you are not going to make it. Um, many of our provinces were saying, we are rural, we will be unable to implement. The states are saying to us that almost every one of us have all these, uh, have Facebook, have WhatsApp, have Instagram, the young people that we are servicing are on these platforms. So when we implement trying to bring that efficiency uh, by integrating ICT in the implementation, that is why we managed to find that we are able to um, roll out this initiative with such a speed of lightning. If you can remember that um, in October, um, 2020, when we were eating, uh, we started informing provinces in October that we want to put the young people in our schools on the 
first of December. Uh, we started around um, September, October, um, October, November. We ran the advert just one week and we put our principals under pressure that we have to put these young people in our schools because it was relief in the homes of these young people. It was more about uh, providing that relief in the homes of the young people. And colleagues, we got cut again. <clears throat> and colleagues, we also looked into the skills that are required from people in terms of the changing world that we are living in. We are looking at the skills that are linked to ICT, that are linked to agility, that are linked to inno innovation. Um, we are looking at skills that we can provide to these young people and they are able to leave our schools and fend for themselves. Colleagues, we also went on to we also went on to look into, as COVID hit our country, the main, main challenge that hit the world was a health crisis. But we know that amidst that health crisis, we found that many other crises came out of that one crisis. We found our fiscus extremely constrained we are working from a bag that is not going to be filled by any other money. So we are working with funds that are constrained. And that is why when we are implementing, we said to provinces, we are asking you to give us people who already have knowledge of, pro of projects that are, that are going to be able to implement uh, the project. Um, using the same policies that we have as government. So we did not go out and appoint consultants. We use our own internal capacity. Uh, colleagues, we know that our schools were vandalized. When schools are vandalized during COVID, they need money to be fixed. Um, we have seen food crisis. Uh, we need money to ensure that um, we are able to deal with that. Colleagues, we have seen um, high migration in some of the areas. You'll see in your own Eastern Cape that um, some of the districts might have lost a lot of uh, young people or of learners, but they moved to another district. So we found that in the country, there are places that are now constrained financially, and we find that others um, have lost a number of people. We are seeing high unemployment um, due to COVID. We have seen looting, and looting came with more people being retrenched, meaning that we find that we continue to constrain, uh, to have that fiscus that is constrained, uh, colleagues. And we are giving this context so that as you are implementing, you appreciate why have we gone with the principles that we have applied in this specific project. And um, colleagues, we are struggling with network. Um, we have also gone further to, yeah, we are struggling with network. Colleagues, we have also gone further to say that as a department, we want to reinvent ourselves, we want to reboot ourselves, we want to re-energize, we want to look into things differently. We don't want to do things the same way as we have done them before. We want to ensure that the energy that we are receiving from the young people, we leverage from it. As, and that means when we get these young people into our schools, we don't take them and put them in gardens to, to do gardening the whole day when these young people are coming with capacity, with knowledge, with skills, and we don't leverage on that capacity that we are given. We just use them in things that we think is just to occupy them. Colleagues, we are going to lose out on what government have given us if we don't leverage on that. Colleagues, we, we came at times that are unusual, at times 
that needed us to think things differently. Um, government came with a vision, the vision that they have looked at what was happening in the country. There's high unemployment, COVID came, it made it worse. We needed vision that says we have to work being flexible, being adaptable. You cannot implement this project if you are not flexible. If you think that you are an eight o'clock to four o'clock type of person, you would not cope with this project. Um, the project team in Eastern Cape, I think they, they, they can attest to that. We call them anytime when we think that we need to intervene in any of the milestones within the project. Um, so colleagues, we really needed um, to come with an implementation that is not the same, that is not usual. Um, we needed people who are agile. You can't Im uh, implement this one if you are not agile. We needed people who can work in networks. We could not achieve without working with you. Alone, we would have never made it. Uh, colleagues, we needed people that are going to constantly communicate because without communicating, we end up not achieving the vision that government have planned with regard to this initiative. Um, I think someone has taken control, please. Um, colleagues, the objectives of the project. When we go to presidency, you find that they have crafted long list of um, objectives but there's just few that I want to touch on that are critical, I, that I believe they are critical, but all of them are critical. Whilst presidency wants to transform the economy, because if you employ this one, one person in that home, uh, they will go and buy in their spaza, their spaza shop next door. Others will go to shop right, others will go. So already you are stimulating back that economy. Because the one who buys in the spaza shop, the spaza shop is ordering some way. The one who buys in ShopRite, ShopRite hires more people. So we are stimulating the economy in that way. Efficiency and effectiveness was key for this project. Um, colleagues, we also want to highlight that we wanted to scale when it comes to um, employment in this initiative. We could only scale in education because we have a school in every village. We operate in nine provinces. We operate in all districts, 75 of them. We operate in all circuits to a village, a township, a city. You will find a school. And through that we are able to expand uh, this public employment and make sure that we come with scale. Um, colleagues, the main one being providing decent jobs. Have we provided decent jobs in the Eastern Cape? You are going to ask yourself that question. Decent jobs means that young person was not sitting at the gate doing nothing for the past five months. That is not a decent job. Um, decent job means we have seen in the Eastern Cape, young people taken for training and they were offered accredited courses that they can leave the project with something that they can take with going forward in their lives. But they can also continue to provide services to our schools, to our communities. But that would be coming because we have provided those uh, decent jobs. We have reduced Youth and also provided meaningful differential learning. So when these young people are in our classrooms, they don't just sit, they receive meaningful experiential learning that can lead them to, to loving education and becoming teachers themselves. We have seen others saying that they are going to study teaching. Colleagues, we have also uh, partnered and forged collaborations it's only through that that we were able to roll out this initiative with a speed of lightning. Colleagues, when you look at SA Youth, they came with their own money. We did not pay SA Youth a cent. 
they come with capacity numbers that were managing those millions of young people who were querying about the project or who were querying about our adverts. We did not have that capacity. Imagine if all our schools had to have queues of people coming to apply. It was COVID and it was um, those levels that were high. We would not achieve without working with our partners and operating um, with, with them. Colleagues, we, the last part that is very critical is to ensure that these young people are going to be led into pathways that will lead into the future so that they don't just come in and stay in our schools and they are not finding anything else beyond this initiative. We want to see them leaving our schools with a bag full of experience, but also leading to other uh, opportunities um, that are linked to what they are interested in. Colleagues, we, we have also, as whilst we are given this capacity, we have 440,000 teachers in the country. And the president says, I'm giving you 300 young people, 300,000 more hands to leverage on. Uh, it's not a permanent stay, this 300,000. So you are given this capacity and we said, with this capacity, we're going to rebuild our our education sector. Um, schools were closed. We have gone through rotational timetables. We have found that the lower classes were affected badly by these rotational timetables. A young person come to school today, is taught how to read. Three days later, when they come back, they forgot what they learned. So we have to start all over. So colleagues, we are seeing this as an opportunity to ensure that we, we build back in a better way. And whilst we are with the objectives of the presidency, we want to ensure that we stick with our, our sector priorities, look at the young people that we have provided in our lower grades. We are saying that they should be focusing on reading and literacy in grade one, two, and three. We know that when you go to schools to monitor, you find the practice different. Reading champions are in grade seven, but when you go to classes grade one, two, three, you don't find the reading champions. That is where we want to see our reading champions. And we are saying, colleagues, this is the time that when we go to phase three, we are able to correct some of these things. Um, we have also said that we want to ensure that math, science, and technology are prioritized, and that you will find in the FET phase that we are specific in there. We are providing even modules to support uh, the young people that are going to be in our classes, assisting in those specific subjects. We have also provided the handyman. Colleagues, the handyman were supposed to maintain infrastructure. But we know that our schools are using them and to, to manage the gardens of our schools. Uh, the minister says, you can do the garden today. Tomorrow when it rains, the grass will grow again. And this young person will leave. As they leave, there will be no evidence of the fact that they were, they were in our schools because they were just doing gardening. So colleagues, they are there to help us to maintain our infrastructure. And colleagues, we have also went on to say that we are offering young people that are going to deal with psychosocial support. And um, those are the, we, we know that our learners have suffered uh, badly when COVID struck. Because learners, some of them see schools as their safety haven. That's where they are not tormented by the outside world, outside themselves. But when COVID struck, some of these young, of these learners were closed in the same home with the same people that are tormenting them. Whether it's emotional, physical, you can name all the torments. Whether it's about food, that they have no food to eat, but in school, 
These are the things that they find comfort, that they, they are catered for. Now, now we are finding that they are suffering these psychosocial um, challenges, and hence we were providing um, the child and youth care worker to take care of that. Uh, colleagues, we are also providing the e cadres that can assist to integrate ICT in our classrooms. We have seen during COVID that that is the biggest challenge. The, the challenge is not only infrastructure, or the challenge is not only um, the gadgets, it's also the knowledge of how to use some of these um, in our schools. We know that you will find the MEC have provided in some schools um, ICT gadgets, but they are not utilized for the purpose that they were intended because there's no one who have the knowledge. So we have wanted to provide the e cadres for that. Colleagues, with this initiative, we also wanted to strengthen governance, accountability, and management of S SMTs and SGBs. You'll ask why. Remember, in our schools, we are implementing in schools that are section 20 and section 21. Already it kicks in that we are talking about schools. Some of them have no financial management responsibilities. And we are saying with this initiative, if we can give guidance, we can set and provide a kind of, of um, structure that schools are able to follow. With regard to the leadership colleagues, we are saying that as a department, we've got solid structures that are supporting the initiative. We have worked with our MECs, with our minister, with our DG and HODs, and we have found favor with everyone in government on this initiative. That's why it's successful. It's because we have found favor with teacher unions, with our SGPs, with our principal bodies. We have consulted with SAPA. We have been in consultation with our QLTCs. And colleagues, as we have said, the sector would have not achieved without acknowledging that the structures that exist have actually assisted in ensuring that we continue to even improve on how we implement. If you check phase one against phase two, you will realize there's quite a number of changes that were implemented. But in phase three, we are still coming with more changes. Um, just to cater for all the inputs that we receive in the sector as we continue to implement. Colleagues, we continue with the next slide, colleagues. Um, we continue to indicate that we have implemented in an inter that we are finding in our own sector. And that is why we are able to achieve. Because you want to save us the sector of uh, learners, that for learners who are living with disabilities, you have to rope in um, the director or chief directorate that deals with that. You want to, to, to cater for young people that are going to assist in curriculum. You have to rope in a curriculum to be part of that. You want to deal with issues of internal audit, you have to bring internal audit to be part of it. But that is what we have seen that in the entire sector, that is what we found. Colleagues, this slide is just trying to bring context to. We have started with the project management team with some of the people, some fell off, but where we continuously have the same project manager, we find that it, the, the project grows um, from strength to strength. We find that um, when we have the same person continuing with the next phase, we find that the, the, the challenges are becomes minimal. We have provinces where they have changed, but it was due to, to, to circumstances 
that uh, the HODs had to, to, to change uh, the project management. But we want to appreciate that in the Eastern Cape, we continue to work with the same person and it has strengthened the implementation on the ground. Colleagues, we have already spoken to this structure. This slide, I want to pass this one. We have indicated that um, the structures that exist have supported the implementation. Colleagues, this slide is just trying to indicate how much um, have been put into the initiative just to ensure that effective and efficiency in terms of implementation. Normally we just meet one hour, but that one hour comes out with documents and it informs implementation. Colleagues, if you have implemented and you have not seen the two documents that are flighted, the first one um, is the one we used for phase one, is the implementation framework for phase one. The second one is the one for phase two. If you have implemented without um, just checking at least one page, then it means you need to go and check. Because you are going to ask me questions and you find that the answers are in these documents. Um, to do that. Let's move on, colleagues. I was just um, showing this specific slide for noting. Can we move on? <clears throat> um, colleagues, here we are just acknowledging our partners who partnered with us for recruitment, and we have already talked to um, this slide. The one partner that, is help, that helped us with um, advocacy and to provide information is ECUPT. ECUPT is a depart Department of Basic Education product. So it's the, 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 the partner that is, that is the departmental baby. So if you take the number and check what's, on, what's in there, it's to support teachers, basically but we have used it in this project to support the assistance as well. Um, the DMS which came through Belela, um, my colleague will talk to that, but we continue to appreciate uh, Belela because they developed this system for us at no cost. Uh, colleagues, we have accomplished um, the phase, first phase we were given seven billion. Remember, Dr. Mabohane said we need to account for public money we were given seven billion. We appointed 320 young people in our schools in the Eastern Cape. You appointed 56,000 young people. And in phase two, we went to six billion. Remember we said the bag is not going to be filled by anyone else. The bag is busy growing. Uh, out. The money is really going out. Now we are going down to, to 6 billion. And we have managed to put in our schools 277,000. Uh, we were supposed to put 287, 10,000. We did not meet uh, the target. Colleagues, all the time we want to do two thirds in our classrooms, one third in um, supporting the surroundings. Some schools change the course. They say, no, we want more outside and less inside the classrooms. Remember one vision, if you tend to change the course, then it means we are not going to achieve our targets. But these are the numbers we were given. And colleagues, we have also provided the six training areas. I have my colleagues who will talk to that and we have saved jobs in those schools that um, parents were unable to pay school fees. So we managed to save jobs in that regard. And colleagues, in the next slide, we are bringing the same slide that, um, Dr. that Dr. Phillips talked to. Uh, we are just indicating that whilst government have achieved 400, have achieved 393,000 in phase one. The department, us sitting here, have contributed 81% of that achievement. They have placed 393,000 in phase one. 
we have contributed 320,000, meaning the bigger number came from us. Colleagues, this deserves your round of applause. You're applauding for yourselves. And the next slide, colleagues, is a combination of phase one and two, where we are indicating that uh, government have achieved 857,000 placements. Us sitting here in this room, we have actually contributed 190,000 those job dis jobs that um, the young people that were. So we have provided 69.5 percent of that achievement. I think we deserve the last round of applause to ourselves. And the la the next slide, colleagues, which might be the last one. Um, is just indicating the social value. I want to talk to just one that I think one of the other colleagues talked to, the multiplier effect. Colleagues, you take one child who have seen that there's no hope for him or her. You just take that one child and you put them in this initiative. You find that you have changed the entire, you have changed all the friends of even how they talk, they change. Even how they see themselves within society, they change. Even how they see the school that they were placed at, they change. So it, this project has that multiplier effect. You change one, you change more than 20 person, people around just this one person. Because you have provided the hope that they never thought they will they will uh, receive anyway. Because remember, some of these young people are, are from childhood at homes where there is no hope whatsoever. Let's move to the last slide, colleagues. The last slide, colleagues, is indicating our 596. It was there in the slide of Dr. Phillips. If you look at that slide, it's saying that um, the jobs that were created by the 13 departments that are implementing the presidential employment stimulus, because it's not only DBE implementing, other departments are implementing. We have by far surpassed what, was, what looked like a huge challenge, and we have implemented uh, 596. Of this 596, I can safely report to you that we have about 22,000 that were in both phase one and phase two, meaning we have actually achieved in terms of placement because it means we did not take the same people from phase one to phase two. And I think that deserves the round of applause because it means we did not, um, we have actually ensured that we appoint at different people. Colleagues, I'm going to step off and allow my colleague, Mr. Maponya, to take on from here to present on training. I wanted to fly this slide the last, so I'm going to skip it, we'll come back to it. Thank you. Uh, colleagues, uh, good morning. Uh, you sound very energetic, which is quite exciting. Uh, again, my name is Takera Maponya. Uh, I'm the project coordinator nationally. And uh, in phase two, I was responsible for coordinating training co uh, nationally. So I'm going to speak on, on training. Uh, the things I want to speak to is our achievements uh, and to focus on areas where I think we can improve. Uh, whether it be us as a sector or as a province. Uh, but I'm going to try to zoom in on the provincial aspects because we're in the Eastern Cape, so I want to focus on what we can do as a province, especially in the next coming five months, uh, to ensure that we achieve the objective of ensuring that every young person that leaves this um, PYEI, they leave having gained meaningful experience, but also they leave knowing that they've gained skills which they would not have had in the beginning when they joined the initiative. So the first slide here just speaks to the issue of the context in which we are 
implementing the training. We speak of organizational culture, which is at the bottom. Those are the things that uh, relate to the norms, uh, our practices, and the way in which we are used to working um, in our environment. And those kind of things, they can either impede our progress or they can help us achieve our objectives. Um, I think we will see as we proceed whether in this province those things have helped us or whether we, have, we need to have a paradigm shift or a different way of approaching our work. I think as Memaj has indicated that, and even the MEC, that the PYEI is, or when it was implemented two years ago, we were starting from the context of COVID. But as a sector, we are trying to leverage this to change the way in which we work because COVID has demanded that we work differently, not only in terms of working from home remotely, MS Teams, but also our attitude towards work and our attitudes toward, towards how can we improve on achieving our objectives. That's very, very important. Um, I now see myself on the screen. I would like to see the presentation. I saw myself in the mirror this morning, so no need to see myself now. Um, so this slide speaks to what we have tried to do because we were in phase two until recently. We are now in phase three. What did we, we, we did is we looked back at our performance in phase one in terms of achieving our targets in the numbers that we wanted to train. Uh, we struggled a little bit as a sector in phase one and we thought what we needed to do was to put a structure in place which will coordinate training. And in this province, uh, Ms. Zandile Magai was appointed as the training coordinator, and she did not have to work on her own, and she was not the one who was supposed to implement the training. Her responsibility was to coordinate the implementation, to monitor whether we are on track, uh, Dr. Mabwani spoke uh, at length about the importance of monitoring. So these structures that we've put in place are to ensure that we keep a constant eye on the progress that we're making. Colleagues might have been in undated with requests for information from Ms. Magai on a weekly basis. It was not of her doing, but it was essential that we did that. I think we'll speak about DMS tomorrow and how it's supposed to help us with monitoring, but we're going to focus ourselves on training here today. So this structure is supposed to help us to improve on the implementation of training, and we hope that it has worked in the province, and we hope that where there were challenges, we're able to pick up on that and see how we can improve. Um, if you can go to the next slide. The, the next slide seeks to, to, to show us the different areas um, that we have in this program. Colleagues will recall that in phase one, we had two hard categories. The, the first hard category was for the education assistants and then everybody else, which was the general school assistants. So what we've done is we've, we've tried to segregate the two by trying to be more clear as to who qualifies or who is regarded as an education assistant. And we have said that those are the young people that are appointed to assist our educators in the classroom, and we call them curriculum assistants. And we also have EKDAS. EKDAS colleagues are supposed to help with administrative duties in the, in the classroom, but also in the school as a whole. And one of the things that made us want to have this category was because we're speaking about ICT integration in the classroom. We have noted that in some instances, our schools have ICT equipments and facilities, but because they don't have someone who can support them to use them, then they end up not being used, and as such, who suffers is the children. And sometimes even our education they themselves don't have the confidence of going into ICT and see how it can improve learning and teaching. I was talking to Memaj yesterday, she was reminding me about the finding of the, the TALIS uh, study, I think it was from 2020, if I'm not mistaken. One of the things that the TALIS did was to find out what were some of the concerns of the educators. And our educators, colleagues in South Africa, reported that they suffer from a lot of work overload. And the work overload, it was not really about teaching because that's the primary core responsibility. But the educators also have to take care of other administrative responsibilities. So we thought that by introducing the ICT or the EKDAS, even the curriculum uh, support uh, assistance can help us introducing and alleviating those pressures. We also have Reading Champions colleagues. Uh, this really speaks to the sector, uh, uh, the, the, the sector targets of improving 
reading and numeracy and literacy, especially in the foundation phase, which our international studies are showing us that that is an area where we need to have an intervention. So hence, the need for us to ensure that we crowd the reading champions, particularly in the foundation phase. But that is not to say that that is where we only, only, and only want them. They can be put in other in primarily, the focus must be on it. In every class in the foundation, in every school, primary school, we crowd them with reading champions. We also have the categories with which we regard as a general school assistants. The one thing I like to say is that colleagues know that the general school assistants are not less important than the education assistants. I think sometimes our attitude maybe t tells us that because that one is in the classroom, then they are better, they are not. All of them support us and the sector as a whole to achieve our objectives. Colleagues know that teaching and learning cannot take place in an environment that is not conducive. So the young people that are appointed as handymen, and this is not something, it's something that we have had a complaint about from some quarters, is that they don't assist in terms of ensuring that our infrastructure is maintained. But if you go and read the implementation framework, it speaks clearly to the roles and responsibilities of the handyman, their responsibilities, colleagues, um, amongst others, to ensure that our school infrastructure is made. We are not saying that they must go and build classrooms where they are not classrooms. What we are saying is they must assist in ensuring that our infrastructure in our schools is well maintained and that learning and teaching takes place in a conducive environment. The child and youth care workers, colleagues, there is one thing that I think I want to speak to here is that, and I think it will be in the next slide as well, but let's stay on this slide, is to say that in each of the provinces, we have said that there must be targeted placement of these young people. Each province should have only appointed a hundred because we are trying to focus on schools in districts, specific districts, where there has been an identification that there's a need to provide additional support for our learners in particular in the area of psychosocial support. And then the other one, colleagues, is sports and enrichment. We know that our schools are you know, environments where our young people learn about culture, learn about all sorts of things, and we also know the importance of uh, being physically active. So we want the sports and enrichment assistance to assist in ensuring that the, the implementation of school sports, arts and culture programs are implemented and implemented effectively. And we have evidence from phase one and phase two that this has actually worked, but having said that, I think it is time that in phase three, we ensure that these young people that are appointed as school and sports enrichment assistants actually do perform those roles and the functions for which they, they've been appointed. But we also note that there is actually more that they can be doing, and we want to encourage all our principals as well to be creative in how best they can use these young people in the schools. Let's go to the next slide, which uh, shows us a categorization of the education assistants, because we have said that in our implementation framework, in terms of the young people that have been appointed in totality across the board, but also in the provinces, even as you go down to the district and the circuits, we are saying that two thirds must be education assistants and a third must be general school assistants. Why we're saying so is because we want to crowd support for teaching and learning in particular. The one main thing which also I think we need to correct and focus our energies on, particularly in phase three, is to ensure that the young people that are appointed as curriculum assistants, they are placed in the correct subjects in the correct phases. Uh, the next slide, which is not showing at the moment, is supposed to categorize what those look like. And that's, that's, that, that slide is taken from the training framework or the training plan, which uh, was drawn up nationally, and we had requested that the province also do the same in ensuring that what has been planned nationally is implemented also at the level of um, the schools as well. We can skip this slide. I think I was looking to the, to the training plan and the framework. I think the slides are going in reverse now. Uh, this one, Ms. Maja spoke to. I don't want to ruin what she said. Yeah, so we're here now. So, colleagues, I don't want to spend too much time on this particular one. This is just the numbers that we 
targeted ourselves to a point in phase one, and the column on the right, which speaks to the number that has been trained, tells us what were our achievements. So the targets are in the middle column, and then on the right, it's the achievements. I'm not gonna speak much to this. The one thing I want to highlight here is that we have not really done as well as we would have hoped for. This particular one speaks to phase two. I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on it. If you look at the first point there, number one, the areas of training there, we regard them as orientation, and they speak to uh, the standard operating procedures for COVID-19. This training colleagues, it's supposed to take place at the school level. We were informed by the line function responsible that at the beginning or in the middle of COVID, the standard operating procedures were, were put together by the Department of Basic, Basic Education, and there was proper uh, training to the, to the rest of the levels in the schooling system to ensure that even at the school level, there is a champion for COVID-19, and that is the person who is supposed to ensure that when we receive our assistance in our schools, they receive training on COVID-19 uh, SOPs. The other one, colleagues, is the National School Safety Framework. Uh, it is essential that the young people actually receive training in this particular uh, modules. The slides are moving much faster. Maybe that's a sign for me to also move faster. <laughs> It's fine. Let, let, let me stay on this one. It's okay. We'll share the slides with you, colleagues. The National School Safety fr uh, uh, Framework is also is a training that is compulsory for all the young people. If you move back to the last slide, you'll see that in terms of our achievement, we have not done as well as we had hoped for. The numbers currently are sitting at 95,000, but this includes phase one and phase two, but we know, we've done a bit of analysis, we know that some people that were in phase one are also in phase two. But currently the numbers are sitting at 95,000. For curriculum, where our target was to train 191,000, but we've been able to, to train 53,000. This is based on the reports, colleagues, that we've received from the provinces. For EKDAS, I'm going to speak to the different areas uh, later. Reading champions, it's uh, one of the areas where we did very well in phase one. In phase two, we're also seeing ourselves doing well, but our improvements, if you compare phase one and phase two, are slightly low. So there's more that we can do in phase three to ensure that every young person appointed as a reading champion receives some kind of training which will em enable them and empower them to fulfill their roles as well. We can move to the next slide, colleague. Uh, so the National School Safety Framework, there are four key modules on it. Uh, the one speaks about violence in South African schools. Uh, I'm not gonna elaborate on this, colleagues. I think we, we know that our schools often are confronted with violence. It could be a young person, whether it be a learner or somebody in the school getting into a fight with the other. We are trying to ensure that we address such issues or even prevent them by empowering our young people, every young person appointed on the PYEI with this training on the National School Safety Framework. The second one is a systemic approach to violence pre prevention. Part three is implementing a National School Safety Framework. Then part, part four, which is the last one, is the management and reporting of sexual abuse and harassment in schools. Colleagues, this training is available online. One of the things that we did at the beginning of phase two we provided guidance to our head offices in the province to say that please ensure that our schools receive data so that they can provide this access to the young people. So what we're supposed to do as district, as circuits, is to share this information with the young people, tell them that this is what you're supposed to do, give them the date by which it has, it, it has to be done, provide them with the resources and the support to allow them to be able to access this. Colleagues may wonder why I'm saying this, maybe it's such an obvious thing, but in our interactions with young people, we are hearing that they don't know how to access this training. They know they're supposed to do it, but they don't know how to access it. So we're asking that, let's reflect on that. What have we done and what can we improve or how can we improve to ensure that young people access this training? At the end of this training, a young person can then print out a certificate of completion, which can then go into their portfolio of evidence to show what they've learned. In terms of our numbers, colleagues, um, in the province, we know what our numbers are that we have appointed, but in terms of our achievements, we have been able to ensure that only 10,000 have registered for these modules online. 
only 10,000. So it means that we have quite a bit of work in phase three to ensure that the rest of the young people access this training. If you can move to the next slide, please. So that's an example of a, a certificate that a young person must have in their portfolio. We've asked our schools to ensure that there's a file for each of their employed young people, which will be like a portfolio of evidence of the work that they would have done in the school and all the other achievements that they would have had. The generic orientation, colleagues might recall that at the beginning of phase two, Dr. Ngosi from the DBE put together the provincial core orientation team and that team was responsible for ensuring that the training cascades down to the districts, the circuits, and eventually to the school level. At the school level, we expect that our principals are supposed to take our young people through the orientation manual, which has been prepared by the DBE. In the province, 9,500 young people have completed the orientation. When we do our monitoring, we are informed by our principals that the training or the orientation has taken place. What seems to be missing is that the information pertaining to the online assessment of the orientation that has taken place is where we have a stumbling block. So we want to ensure that one of the things that we must have as the outcome of this workshop is to ensure that our principal are aware that after conducting that orientation, then they need to ensure that the young people have access to the online link and then they can do the orientation there. It's only a couple of, it won't even take an hour or two. Then they can uh, complete a, an easy assessment because it's based on what they would have learned. And it's really pretty, for, uh, pretty straightforward questions that they have to deal with. Then at the end of that, they can receive uh, a certificate as well. If you look at the numbers that uh, the Eastern Cape has achieved, it's actually quite high compared to the rest of the provinces because we are talking about a, an achievement of 48,000 but if you look at the contribution of the Eastern Cape colleagues, the Eastern Cape has contributed close to 20% of that. Close to 20% of that. And I think that's, even though we may not celebrate that achievement, let's clap hands for ourselves because compared to the other provinces, there's a bit of a struggle there. Uh, I now see the audience. Maybe it's just for me to see who's listening and who's not. <laughs> So that's just an example of the certificate. We can skip that. Colleagues, I'm going to focus quite a bit of time on the next one because we are living in the 21st century and in the sector, we speak about skills for the 21st century. I think this is something that all of us, all of us have heard of in the past two, three, four years a lot, and we keep hearing about it. So we are also embracing the 21st century skills. We are saying, let's ensure that our young people are empowered with these particular skills. So I'm not gonna speak to this slide, but if you can move to the next one, this is just the rationale. So colleagues, we've had a number of partners that have come on board. They have said to us, we are seeing that you want to empower young people with meaningful skills, tangible skills, and portable skills. And they said to us, how can we get involved? So those are the partners, colleagues, is Digify Africa. They are providing a, a course on online safety training. And this one is compulsory training for all the young people. Later, I will speak to the numbers that we have achieved, which is meant to ensure that going forward, we improve on those numbers, because these are compulsory for all the numbers that we have appointed. The other one is provided by Nemisa. Colleagues might be familiar with Nemisa because in the past couple of weeks, it's when this was taking off the ground. It's when we are asking about the registration at the school level. And this one is about digital literacy course. And it is for all the appointed youth in the PYEI. This one here is specifically uh, provided for uh, the young people appointed as ECADAS. It's uh, provided by the University of Johannesburg. It is artificial intelligence in the fourth industrial revolution. Some of the contents there, which I'll speak to later as well, is, is coding and robotics. And again, colleagues, that's something that we're moving towards as a sector as well, but also the world is moving towards that as well. The other one is the, provided by the Nelson Mandela University and is the readiness assist, um, assessment. It is provided by the, by, by, for all the EKDAS. So this slide here is just meant to show us how long each of the training areas are supposed to take. The first one provided by Digify Africa, which is the online safety, compulsory for all the young people. It only takes three days, colleagues. 
uh, and this one is also self-mediated. So you go on your cell phone, there's a chat board there, you register the number that you're supposed to chat with, and then you get going only three days, and then you're done. The one provided by the University of Johannesburg, as you can imagine, the University of Johannesburg is an institution of higher learning, so they provide those kind of training. So this one is a 10-week kind of training. Um, like I said earlier on, it's for the artificial intelligence in the fourth industrial revolution. And this one can be accessed on the University of Johannesburg portal. It's only for EKDAS. So what is required of the province is to ensure that all the EKDAS appointed in our schools, their, their registration information is provided to the University of Johannesburg so that their information can be pre-populated. Let me give this example, colleagues. If I am not a student at the University of Nelson Mandela, I will not be able to sit for an examination, whether it be in engineering, whether be it in education, whatever, but I need to be registered first. That's why it is essential that for this particular one, we ensure that our young people, we provide the relevant information as requested in the format requested so that they are able to be registered and they can then access the training. That's the one part. Then with NEMISA, five weeks, colleagues, uh, we have five months, but this one is only five weeks. Let's ensure that where there's still space, let's close that gap. Remember, this one is compulsory for all the young people in the province. I've showed you the numbers for the province. Let's ensure that those who are left behind catch up in the next five months. Only five weeks, and they also need to be registered on the NEMISA platform. We have received questions up from young people asking us, how do I access this training? Colleagues might remember that sometime, I think in January, or from January, even December, we were asking that our schools, our circuits, districts, must provide the information for the young people to be registered for these modules. Now, young people are getting on the link because they are communicating with each other on Facebook. Someone has shared a link on Facebook to say, this is the link you can use. Then when I get there, because I'm not registered, I'm not able to participate. So where there is a gap, which is where the gap is in terms of registration, let's ensure that we provide the necessary information for the young people to access that training. The other one is the Nelson Mandela University uh, Irreginous um, Assessment. Only two hours, colleagues, it's a webinar. Just sit down, attend a webinar, and then you get the instructions, then you're done. I didn't speak about MTN and DG Campus, but they are also providing online education portals. This one's also two hours, it's a webinar, and then you're done. In the time that we've been here since the morning, colleagues, since nine, nine o'clock, but I see that all of you were here very, very early, around eight o'clock. In the time that we've been here, some of us would have been done with two training modules already in the time that we've been here. What I'm saying is that it really isn't that complicated. If we are able to support our young people with the relevant information, if we register them on the platforms, if we provide them with the access to network, then two hours, you're done with one thing, and then you can provide that put, put, uh, uh, information in your portfolio. Then there's the last one, which is uh, financial literacy, and this is provided by uh, Belela Technologies. We can move to the next slide, thank you. This one here is also compulsory, so I'm gonna provide the details of the online safety training, which is provided by or through Digital, Digify Africa. The one thing I'm going to ask you to do now, I see some of you are already on your cell phones, uh, please keep them on. If you're not on your cell phone, let's do it now. Take your cell phone. Uh, I hope it's a smartphone. I know some of us use those small ones. I don't know what you, what you call them in the Eastern Cape, but I hope by the time I leave, I'll know what they're called, uh, those small ones. But if you have a, a, a smartphone, colleagues, let's dial this number on our cell phones now. It's 076-076-593. 7181. 076-593-7181. And I'm sure some of you already have this information because you would have been exposed to this at some point. So don't be surprised if it pops up on your phone. Save the number as Kitso, K-I-T-S-O. Kitso means knowledge in the Sotho uh, languages. I think we probably should have given it a different name here to reflect the demographics of the, of the province. Kitso is knowledge. So once you've done that, colleagues, you go to your WhatsApp, look for the contact Kitso, and type hi, the number hi, H-I, 
and then it will take you through the next steps as to what you need to do to complete this training. So once a young person has done that, the modules that they can access relate to dig digital presence, uh, community standards and reporting, bullying and harassment, and colleagues might probably wonder why are these things important. If you are on social media, especially a place like Facebook or Twitter, you may have come across some of the rude things that people say to each other. And this is why it's important for us to expose our young people to this kind of training. So it's bullying and harassment, online safety. Uh, some of us maybe pay our bills online through our cell phones or maybe through our laptops. Right now I'm sitting here, but my laptop is down there on my desk. I don't know if Ipeleng has transferred some money to him. I might have. And by the time I realize, maybe there'll be nothing in my account. But I may not know who has done that. So online safety is quite essential. Misinformation and fake news. I think this is something that Mr. Mklanga is going to speak to later. I'm not going to touch on what this means, but we understand colleagues. Just in February, there were a lot of stories about what's going to happen in phase three. Some were saying, no, we'll get contracts for 12 months. Some were saying, no, this thing's going to become permanent. Because people in this day and age are very creative, they are very smart, but they want to be the first ones to communicate, whether it's wrong information or correct information. But as sitting here, we are saying that we want to be able to say that a young person must be able to, to, to discern that this information is correct, this one here is misinformation, and this particular one here is fake news, because there are platforms that we use to communicate information. And the other one is about prep privacy and then the other one is about digital tools for the, edu for, the, for the classroom. Colleagues, as a province, we have been able to register 13,244 young people on this platform. So there's a, a shortfall which we need to address in this coming phase so that we can ensure that every young person is able to access this particular training. Remember I said earlier on that it's compulsory for all of the young people. Let's move on to the next slide. So I'm going to skip this one broadly. I'm going to skip this one as well as just to indicate the numbers broadly. We can skip it. This one also is just to say that once a young person has been done with the training, they can print the certificate. They can also put it in their portfolio of evidence. So we know that when we go and monitor and when the AG also goes to do the audit, they're able to say this person has done this training this person has not done this training, and then that can help us also in providing the relevant evidence. I'm going to skip this one. The slides will be shared with you. This is just the details of the NEMISA training. I want to dwell on this one slightly, if you can go back slightly. The digital literacy training, which is compulsory for all the young people through NEMISA, the young people will learn introduction to digital literacy. On this particular one, the next point is about introduction to MS Office. MS Office, we know it's Outlook. It's Excel, it's all those nice packages. Colleagues, you might have said in interviews at some point, maybe some of you recently, not for yourself, but because you are trying to appoint someone or assist in the appointment of someone. One of the required skills, colleagues, is proficiency in or computer literacy, number one. Number two, proficiency in the MS suit. And often we hear young people especially saying that they are proficient in this and that, but when it's time for us to ask them to do those uh, graphs on Excel. Then we are told, no, uh, the, for this one, I need training. And we know that organizing training can take a bit of time because you must then get a list of what the requirements are, how many people are interested in this training, procure a service provider. By the time you're done, five months have gone. But during that five months, the work must continue to take place. So this is quite important. The other one is a uh, introduction to cyber security, and the last one is introduction to digital technologies. Very, very important and very meaningful skills that we need to provide to our young people. So these ones are provided through online webinars. They are self-paced, and like I said earlier on, five weeks, you're done and dusted, and then you get your certificate. And they can be accessed through the NEMISA portal. Like I said earlier on, our ensure that we provide uh, the colleagues in the head office with the information of all the young people appointed in our province, in our district circuits, so that they can be registered on the NEMISA portal for them to be able to easily access the information. Thank you very much. Next slide, please. 
I'm going to skip this one. Um, it just provides the training journey uh, for the NEMISA course. Uh, you'll see this when you get the, the, the slides. It just shows what happens in the 55 weeks uh, training that um, one, not 55, five weeks, five weeks that the training take place. Next slide, please. This particular one slide just shows us as a province in terms of how many young people are registered on the system is 8,300. This is again for us to reflect and say, where are we? And what is, we are below 50%. So we need to ensure the young people that are not registered on the system are given the necessary support to be able to be registered and then take part in the training. The next slide, please. I want to skip this slide. It just provides the, the, the training that is provided by the University of Johannesburg on artificial intelligence in the fourth industrial revol revolution. Suffice to say that, as, like I said earlier on, part of the training is about coding and robotics. And you'll agree with me that this is quite essential. And if you were to go on your own and register at the University of Johannesburg, you'll be paying thousands and thousands and thousands of rents. So we are providing this to our young people free of charge colleagues. Next slide, please. The numbers uh, uh, overall, uh, remember this is only for EK, 22,000. Currently, we have only reg registered 7,000 on the system. That's for the whole country. And in the Eastern Cape, we have registered 1,800 relative to the 7,000. It is actually quite a good achievement, but we can ensure that we a point or we have more people registered on the system so that more and more people can actually uh, benefit from this. You can skip this slide, it's just a picture of the previous one. I will now hand over to Mr. Lohodi to take us through the presentation on the financials. Thank you very much, colleagues. Okay. Uh, colleagues, my name is Upita Lehodi. Basically, colleagues, I'll be speaking to the financial performance of the project. I know that colleagues, when I'm standing here in the front, they get worried. Because remember, numbers don't lie, colleagues. Ne? I'll be speaking to the number of placements that as a province you've achieved. My colleague Ume Maje has touched a bit on it, but I'll be focusing on your province and globally in terms of the national project. Okay. Uh, next slide. Okay. On this slide here, colleagues, which Ume Maje has touched on, uh, for your province, if you can see, you were allocated 40,000 jobs in terms of phase two. And if you look at this, colleagues, you are the third highest in terms of jobs that you needed to create. I heard MEC when he was speaking at T, without Eastern Cape, nationally, we would not achieve. And if you look at that being the third highest, if you don't perform nationally, it would not reflect a good picture. So Umema just spoke about the two-third. Remember, colleagues, our core function is in that classroom. But again, Baba Maponya touched on the fact that without the support, and that's why we're giving one-third, that's why we're giving one-third to, to general assistance to ensure that they receive the necessary support. Colleagues, on this slide that's reflected here, uh, unfortunately, technology let us down. But in Kate's presentation, there is a question that she asks to say, are we a capable state? Are we a capable state as South Africa? And in this slide here, we are confirming that yes, we are a capable state. In phase one, as Umema J 
stated we were allocated 319 jobs that we were supposed to achieve, which we achieved about 320. But focusing on Eastern Cape, you were allocated 50, 55,803 jobs. And as Eastern Cape, you achieved to appoint that number. Colleagues, doesn't that deserve a round of applause? In phase two, as a province, you are allocated about 40,000. And we have seen that you were able to achieve to appoint 39,000. And if you look at this slide here, you actually are fourth highest province in terms of achieving uh, the target. We know that the 3% difference from the 97% that you've achieved, it's, due, it's basically the, the issue of leaving the stem. Doesn't that again deserve a round of applause, colleagues? <laughs> colleagues, what we do as, as national and even the project managers from the, the, the provincial teams on a weekly basis, we, can we go to the next slide? The slide before colleagues, uh, okay. Can we just go back a bit, colleagues? All right, thanks, colleagues. On this slide here, colleagues, Umema just spoke about uh, the stimulus having 13 departments that are supposed to implement. And as you can see there, colleagues, as DBE or as a basic education sector for this initiative, we were allocated the bulk of the budget, which is the six billion, which, uh, which is about 62.7 of the total budget of the nine billion that has been allocated for the stimulus. And colleagues, as you can see, as basic education sector, if we don't achieve, we would not, if we don't achieve as a sector, it means in terms of the stimulus in totality, it shall not achieve. Here, colleagues, on the slide that's reflected, this is just the budget that has been allocated in terms of phase two. We have spoken to the numbers, and as a province, you are allocated in total, 841 uh, million to, 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 to place youth in, 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 in this initiative. And as you can see from their colleagues, you are the third highest in terms of the bulk budget that has been allocated. And therefore meaning, again, confirming what the MEC had said, if Eastern Cape does not achieve, therefore nationally we shall not achieve. Next slide, colleagues. Colleagues, what we had done here, as colleagues were saying, that we are reflecting on, on how we've performed in terms of the initiative. On this slide here, we're reflecting the spending performance uh, in terms of phase one. And we are seeing that as Eastern Cape focusing on the percentage spent, you had spent about 78%. But when Mema J was uh, presenting, she spoke that in terms of phase one, we were actually given a week to implement. And in a week, throughout the five months, we were able to achieve 78%. I know finance would look at this and say, this is an underachievement. But in terms of the time that we had in, in, in implementing this initiative, the province has done very well. And that deserves a round of applause, colleagues. <laughs> Next slide. Uh, as I stated, colleagues, that on a weekly basis, we have one-on-one -on -one meetings just for us to get the progress from the province in terms of your performance uh, on the initiative. And here, what we had done on the 18th, we had gotten information of people that have been paid by the province. Uh, and as we can see, in November, you had paid the bulk of the appointed youth, which is the 39,000, similar so up until the end of February. Uh, in phase one, colleagues would recall that we had a huge challenge of non-payment. Yes, we know in terms of this phase, your province had a bit of a challenge, but you were able to overcome it by ensuring that all the youth that were appointed, especially in the first three months of the initiative, received their money. Uh, here, colleagues, is just a report that we receive from your province based on the numbers that you've placed as to how much you have paid. And in total there, we are seeing you've paid about 628 million. Uh, and then in terms of the program as a whole, we are seeing that we've paid about 4 billion from the 6 million. 
from the six billion that's been allocated. And this only colleagues focuses on the payments of the stipends. As you've seen on the screens that I had reflected around the budget, most of the budget goes towards employment of youth, which is the stipends. And we have paid about four billion as a sector, and this is as at the end of February. Uh, what we do over and above, colleagues, next slide, colleagues, what, what we do just for us to compare whether what you have reflected as paid, is it in line with the number of youth that have been appointed in schools? And on the slide that, that has been reflected now, what we will then do is just do a comparison, just to reconcile where your numbers are in line with what was expected to be paid. And we seeing from the provincial report, you had provided that you've paid about 621, but from the expected payment calculated, we've paid about 602, meaning that there's some sort of overpayment of 19 million. But remember, colleagues, this just requires us to do a reconciliation just to verify whether the numbers are in line. So the project team, we just need to ensure that we do the reconciliation. But we know that in terms of the UIF employer contribution might be part of the 19 million that's not reflected as, as unpaid. And then in terms of the sector as a whole, we are seeing there's a difference of about 92 million. Uh, from the same reports, colleagues, we would be requesting provinces to provide us with their update in terms of the expenditure report. And we are seeing the, uh, this report which has now been updated that at, as, as at the 18th of March, as a province from the 841 that you were allocated, you had spent about 404. But I can comfortably or confidently say that this has moved and we are seeing your province is sitting, as at the 30th, your province is sitting at about 91%. Therefore, meaning that the schools that re had to receive the funds that to, in order for them to be able to pay the stipends have received the necessary allocation. But over and above, colleagues, just for us to reconcile and compare, we would go into our budget reporting system, which is Vulindlela or BES, just for us to compare as to your report versus what BES Vulindlela reflects as paid, how far apart are we? And that report reflected as at the, 21, at the 21st, we had seen that you were sitting at 76%. Uh, and a comparison between what you have paid as, 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 as a province versus Vivulindlela, there was just the difference of 234. But as I said, now you have moved as a province and you're sitting at about 91%. Colleagues, I have come to the end of my presentation. Thank you. Let's also give UDP a round of applause, colleagues. Uh, I, I just want to request Upepe and Dombomzi. Also, anyone who might have picked up an ECDO in MTEC of HN Bongoza. Please also bring it forward, ne? And in the next call, I'll put my name in last language. Colleagues, can I request a choir to render us one piece of their songs, please? A choir, please. The I want to be restless, ni butinwa. Thank you. Just two before Uma Bustia.
Moreni. Tumelang. Uh, colleagues, I am Luka Nyositia, the provincial manager of the Presidential Youth Employment Initiative in the Eastern Cape. Uh, when the commander in chief speaks, because I am the founder of this project. And everybody that is here, they are invited because I sent the invitation to them. So today, colleagues, as I'm going to be tabling to you what we have done good as the province, I really humble myself before you. We are here, colleagues, to share what the province has managed to do good, especially when we have visitors from DPE. We know very well what we are unable to do, but today we are coming to tell DPE that bring back the money to the Eastern Cape because we are, and when we are working in an integrated manner, we are able to see the result that was tabled before us through the financial report, through the performance report. So my presentation today, unfortunately, colleagues, will only center around the good that we do in this province. The good that each district, each circuit manager does will be a reflection of this presentation. If you are here again to listen to the challenges, we'll call you one-on-one -on -one of the department and we'll definitely discuss our challenges. My name here is Luca, and I only concentrate on light, and I think the name itself speaks to you colleagues to say, the only thing I concentrate in investing in energy too, it is what is good. So I'm only going to talk to what we are able to do as the province. As uh, Lala and your team, you are welcome. And as I'm going to be analyzing the performance report and the project in, in, in its totality, I want to assure you that this presentation is not a presentation that has been made by Mamosetia. Yeah? We have information received from the di districts, from the circuits, and I think as a project a coordinators, they introduced that we are not alone here as a province, but our circuits are also here. Circuit managers were appointed as project team members. District directors were appointed as project managers. So any question that you're going to get from this house is going to be a question that is coming from project managers. I can assure you we are going to ask, but we are going to ask questions that are relevant to the project because we are part of the project. When this uh, colleague's initiative came, unfortunately, okay, it came to the province of the Eastern Cape who are battling with the rives of COVID-19. A COVID-19 colleagues is a disaster that came unplanned, and as a sector, we had to come with interventions that were going to address the impact of COVID-19. It is very evident, dear colleagues, that no one COVID-19 made us realize that no one is guaranteed about waking up having the same job because the COVID-19 led to retrenchments. Some people did not plan that today they were going to be unemployed. When you're looking at the international statistics from labor, uh, you can see that job losses are happening each and every day. And also in the Eastern Cape province, colleagues, you know, we don't have mines. Who government our major employer, but COVID-19 made even those small companies those small factors that we depend on to create employment for the, especially for the unemployed in the Eastern Cape, in the Obama, the value. That's why I get this project is for our heart because in the Eastern Cape, the president came to open a mine, a mine that could take at the same time 55,806 unemployed youth. When you look into the background, your colleagues, it was announced, and you know, as a public servant, when the president speaks and announces something in parliament, that becomes law. 
And if he can deviate, there are going to be steps that the president must take uh, when he wants to, de to deviate on an activity that he has committed before he cap the cabinet. He announced E500 million, that was a contribution to the economic revival st stimulus packages. And fortunately, Getina is an important sector. We are given a share out of that portion. Uh, Eastern Cape, I mean, the, the sector uh, in the first phase, we, there was an investment of seven million, and Eastern Cape benefited your colleagues from that uh, seven million. We know the last first phase, we recruited, but we also saved jobs in independent uh, schools, because that was the mandate that was given by the president to say, let us not only focus on public education or on public schools, but we must also look at independent schools, because we also have a band there that are affected by this COVID-19. Uh, I'm going to Zoom, get colleagues, and was Gustav again, unfortunately, these slides, if you can help me. Uh, when you're looking at the Eastern Cape colleagues, this is the population per district in the Eastern Cape. Uh, the biggest district uh, that has got a population in, in the Eastern Cape, uh, Sislala, is O.R. Tambo. And I'm sure uh, when we're presenting or when we're acknowledging a guest from O.R. Tambo, you could see that the, it, was, uh, it was once called the mega district, ne? but it's still big. O.R. Tambo, okay, it's a combination of both, O.R. Tambo, coastal as well as inland. Inland, again, O.R. Tambo represents 20% of the uh, Eastern Cape population, followed by Nelson Mandela with 17%, Yamatole at 14%, Krisani 12%. So when you're looking at the population, your colleagues, the bigger the district, when you look at the stats from labor, those districts are grossly affected by the unemployment rates. Hence, when we allocate uh, these EAs and GSAs, we focus those districts that are, in terms of the stats, are bigger districts. Then let's look at the education attainment level. I think we MEC covered colleagues to say if we don't have direction as the Department of Education, all other departments are not going to have a direction. So when you look at the Eastern Cape Care colleagues, uh, the blue, uh, upper course slide, the color blue represents the population of the people of the Eastern Cape that do not have education at all. Then the, the Lene Orange, it's a uh, population of people who have got less than metric. I always say okay, when you are in education and you analyze that orange, it means that as a department, there is a lot that we still have to do because the, the learners, when they enter grade one, we must say to it that by a Puma grade 12, having achieved at least grade, uh, grade 12 as a certificate. So when you look at the population of the Eastern Cape, uh, Isara Batman is at 61%. It uh, represents a gap about to that have got less, I mean, qualification as metric, then the metric and higher, then the other, uh, the, that is yellow, it represents uh, those that have got a qualification. And this, uh, colleagues, is very relevant because when you are uh, recruiting education assistance and general we wanted as the sector to concentrate because we're in education sector to EAs and GSAs that have got a qualification but because this strategy is aligned to economic revival strategy even those who do not have a grade 12 they are affected by COVID-19 hence we said as a sector we are going to be biased towards EAs because EAs who has stayed in the sector and at, at least have achieved a grade 12. That's why when we do our, loc our location colleagues, we've got more EAs than GSAs because we are saying, if we're a GSA, we are just coming to show you in Doba how sexy it is to, be a, to have a, a grade 12 holder. So that our GSAs now, after this project, we want them to go back and say they want to attain at least a grade 12 because this strategy, as much as we are re uh, looking at reviving the economy, but it must work towards us as the sector achieving our strategic objectives. Uh, the objectives, yes, is Lala, I'm, I'm sorry, I have to go through them and remind my colleagues as we are going to be presenting a phase three that the objectives have not yet changed. Uh, they are coming from the president. Uh, they wanted transformation of the economy. I know that the word transformation is not a very ideal word to those who benefited before 
Yeah, when when you redress care colleagues, you must be somebody who is very strong, who will talk transformation without any fear. And I think I like this bullet because it's number one in the presidential uh, uh, objective to say we want to transform the economy uh, and also building back together. We stimulate and we expand and we also talk, we reduce youth unemployment. So in the sector care colleagues, we then aligned our strategies to... We aligned the objectives of the sector to what the president wanted to, to achieve, and I think uh, UDPE project objectives, they are very clear. The national project team has actually uh, presented the, the, the DPE project objectives. I am not going to dwell, Guzo, but our responsibility in every government, in every democratic uh, government, we talk of alignment. If our strategies are not aligned, then we are not going to achieve what we want to achieve as government, because the government, your colleagues, immediately we want to implement projects in a disintegrated manner, then we are not going to realize the vision of government. So hence we are saying, as the sector, before our business plans were approved, we had to prove to the president that our business plans are aligned to what the president wanted to achieve. Uh, in the province of the Eastern Cape, get colleagues from DPE, I want to share with you that we've got a project team that is composed of a project managers in the head office. We've got it at a district level, uh, all district directors, they were all appointed in writing uh, together with our circuit managers, our deputy directors, HR, as well as finance. They are all uh, coordinating uh, and making sure that the project achieves its objectives. Then at a school level, what we also did is in the province, we, issue, we, we, we appointed our school principals in writing because we wanted them to know that this project is coming to stay, colleagues. We cannot expect as a province somebody who's going to say, hi, this EI of yours, we don't understand. This EI is implemented at a school level. The ownership must be taken by us. It must be taken by the principals because they are the ones that are driving the recruitment. No one in the district offices or in our head offices all got the appointment. So when we want the investment, AIS Colwin, we must also make sure that we, we, we emphasize the accountability part because we cannot only want resources without wanting the account. So our school principals in the Eastern Cape, they were appointed in writing as well as uh, orientated by the district teams. Uh, in, in 2021, we were given an opportunity, 0.55,803, and that we achieved. Then also in 2022, 2021-2022 uh, financial year, an allocation for year appointment of 40,316 uh, was created by the Eastern Cape, and that was achieved. Uh, phase one, okay, talking of the investment colleagues, uh, that was the total investment that was given to the Eastern Cape. 876 million is dipensing with 789. As you see, yeah, the, the, the breakdown for phase one was like that. And yeah, each district, as yeah, I'm presenting uh, the following slide, um, it, it talks about the number or the opportunities that we were offered to districts uh, to implement for their schools. And as you see, yeah, each district, there is no district yeah, that has been included in Akange Ifumane, the allocation in phase one. Uh, these were the opportunities that we created uh, for phase one. Then when you're looking at the economic benefit, colleagues, when you analyze any project of government, you have to look at as a Indlela that how have you turned economically? Because when you look at the objectives of the Presidential Youth Employment Initiative, it is evident that the President wanted to revive the economy, and one of our fundamental principles is to see how much have we contributed as the project into the in our regions, as you see, your colleagues, the expenditure in terms of the payments that were implemented on personal. I know, your colleagues, uh, district directors, you did not see this money coming to your budgets, but you got to see it because it was on personal and it benefited the EAs that we have appointed. So when you're looking at the investment, your colleagues, the economic benefit that has been received, for example, in Alfrenzo, uh, the total expenditure that we invested from the project, it was 
two million but ninety six and that really colleagues in Yenza London City really as the sector we did manage to achieve what the president has uh, wanted to achieve in a project. Uh, when you're moving to phase two, get colleagues, because the presentation is to, going to talk about the phase two as well as phase one. Uh, that was the allocation, and this is what to DPE um, uh, through the framework uh, they guided the province to implement. And the investment in terms of the national investment, we're at 14 percent. I think finance from DPE has confirmed that, but the uh, budget has been allocated. And for phase two, the minister was very clear to say we need to invest in skills. Uh, India skills, dear colleagues, is something that is very close to my heart because I'm responsible for human resource development. When you give an unemployed youth a skill, a investment, Eastern Cape does not need uh, more administrators or any HR specialists, but we need skills that are going to make our young people not to depend on government for employment. So you'll see our investment because in reality, if we are going to continue investing in soft skills, it means that next year we'll have the same EAs who'll be wanting to come back and be EAs seven. And you know, in the Eastern Cape, we've got a strike of interns, interns not wanting to exit the system because they feel it, the government has got the obligation to take them. That that is an indication that the skills that we have invested in them cannot make them independent. government for employment. So when we think about this project, dear colleagues, and when we want to revive the economy, we must think of flexible and we think of other opportunities that we can create. And we say, as the Eastern Cape, through this project, this is what we have achieved because out of the pool that we recruited, we've got EAs and GSAs now that do not need education as an employer, but they have created their own opportunities. So in terms of the categories, get colleagues, I think we should be and we understand. Then the Eastern Cape uh, application statistics colleagues, if you look at what we have received, thank God that we used uh, USA Mopi or Uharambe for recruitment because now we are able to have a data that is going to talk to us. If you look in the data, get colleagues, out of the 40,000 opportunities that we have, um, we, we, we had advertised as the province, a rate in terms of number of applications, it was 613,266. It's an indication, dear colleagues, the level of desperation amongst the young people, the level of unemployment in the province. So when we implement this project, we always say it must be implemented under objective principles because if you look in each district in the following slide, it analyzes each district. For example, in OR Tambo Coastal, your target was to take 5,000 unemployed youth, but you got 98,000 applicants. How do you start the recruitment process if you've got 98,000 applicants, now will be qualifier, yet you are only looking for 5,000? So those things, get colleagues, they make us, in the but at least when you've got quality data, when you move for stage two, we are able to use the information that we have, but it is a very bad in, uh, information, colleagues, because it shows that the province as a whole, the Eastern Cape, we've got high levels of unemployment. So implement this project in an objective manner. So no, we could not get in because uh, the competition was very tight, because the applications were never needs. Hence, we emphasized in phase two that we must monitor such that a unemployed youth, they are not given an opportunity to participate because they've got relatives in schools. They must go through a clean process of screening and, and, and appointing. Then in phase two, get colleagues, these are, these are confirmed opportunities. As you see, uh, Amatole East and Buffalo City, uh, Amatole East is at 99%, uh, Buffalo City is at 7%. Uh, this is not because, get colleagues, we did not want to implement the project. It is because of schools. You know, get, there are schools that are, that are a quintile of fours and five schools 
that have ESGPs who did not want to implement the project. But all other schools in the, pro, in the province, Gapandli, Kwez districts get that, have got schools that are quintile four and five, and they have implemented the project. And in terms of the provincial performance, we are at 98%, but those numbers get that you see red, it's because we did not achieve 100% because of schools as a tenor, they do not want to participate in the project. Then on phase two, get calling, this is the economic benefit. Uh, on monthly basis, get colleagues, we are not investing less than 100 million uh, as the project in the districts through the implementation uh, of East stipends. So if you look, uh, you zoom into your district, you will see how much investment we have implement, uh, we have made and achieved as the project uh, from November up until March. So Nyani, get colleagues, the reality is that as much as the sector has benefited, we economic affairs as well as the treasury, they must take pride in this data presenting because we did not only address teaching and learning, but the project has managed to really achieve the economic uh, recovery strategies that are not necessarily aligned to the, to the Department of Education, which is the, the, the basic education. Uh, looking at the training focus areas, uh, we had uh, set nine types of trainings that we had to implement, and we have been saying get to the districts that they must motivate the EAs to complete these trainings because one of the requirements in phase three is that uh, EEAs, there are compulsory trainings that they should have completed before they move to the second phase, I mean to, to the third phase. So it, we are calling upon uh, our circuit managers, our district project managers to make sure that as we are going to be consolidating data, we look at, in, at EAs who manage to attend uh, e compulsory trainings that we are to implement. Then in terms of the trainings, yeah, colleagues, I think we as the province, uh, we've moved uh, with 100% on the child uh, youth care workers, on reading champions, we're at 68%, on e-sports enrichment assistance, we're at 82%, uh, e-handymen, we're at 84%, EEK does, EK does at 97%, and also e-curriculum, we are at 56.2%. Moving to the training, get colleagues that we as the Eastern Cape take pride in, because I think OTPE forgot to mention that Eastern Cape led the implementation of handyman training that August. We are the only province that did that training with accredited qualifications on vocational education. We'll show you, get colleagues, because we are saying we are here to showcase uh, our achievement. Um, we, 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 both in phase one and phase two, we have trained or invested uh, on e-handyman training where uh, uh, unemployed youth uh, were taken from the districts and they were registered through e border training center and they are now going to be getting a qualification e-trades. E-trade is a is a scarce skill. It's a very expensive skill. But in Maliga project, our president has managed to get 2.4 unemployed youth from the Eastern Cape that are going to have Ilenduka the 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 the, the, the qualifications. All soccer colleagues uh, through uh, e stakeholders who are giving us a pressure around the the investment of this handyman for unemployed youth that has got a disability. We do have that training at targeting 100. It's going to be implemented for a disabled uh, unemployed youth with a disability. In, by 100, it's a special area. Ipota Training Center is, is going to be collaborating with you off to be implementing that training. It's also one of the kind. It is just the Eastern Cape. I also get colleagues in the Eastern Cape, we are also noticing that uh, EEAs, they are resigning. They are not resigning yet because they are going to be unemployed. Some have applied through Ifunzalo Shaka Basari. They have chosen now education as a career of choice because through them being trained in these programs, they by Tandile education, we've got some that Abba uh, Rizainayo to say they've got Ipesaris and MEC had just announced Ipesari collaborating with uh, Walter Sulu University where we are registering 200 on PGC unemployed youth who have EAs, but now because equalifications are teaching, they are 
coming back to 2 pgc I think that also, Sislala, is something that the Eastern Cape is the only province that has started to do. Uh, also, uh, colleagues, uh, the, the, I think okay, the, we've got two attributes that are unique in the province. Uh, in phase one, we were the only province that uh, moved for UPESAL implementation. In phase two, I think uh, we were a bit not confident, but definitely in phase three, we are going back to our PESAL because this non payment is more whatever good that we have done in the province as now you controlled because the non payment was not controlled by the Eastern Cape Department of Education stakeholders, not by the project manager, but by treasurer. I want the stakeholders before they come here, they know exactly that the payment delays was a joint effort. And, and unfortunately, as government, we delayed, but we did say sorry to the participants and we did pay them okay, after on time. Then also okay, we also meet a uh, daily six o'clock meetings with the districts as well as circuit officers. Uh, then okay, colleagues, I think Usus uh, Nyamike is going to showcase exactly what we have done uh, through the, the videos that we have con uh, con uh, uh, consolidated as the project. Uh, you know, okay, colleagues, to us, uh, we see this initiative as a strategic opportunity in the Eastern Cape. I know its implementation, your colleagues, came, uh, it was only five days when we were told that we have to implement this project. And I'm happy because we are part of the mistakes that were made in phase one. We reduced some mistakes for phase two, but as we are moving for phase three, we are going to leave all the other things that are not good to phase one and phase two, and we are, we are hoping to, 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 to move. So when you look at the skills development aspect, dear colleagues, of this project, we, it has given a, us an opportunity to rethink colleagues and uh, to rethink the implementation of education strategies in the province. You know, get Aiko Indo Enzima than to rethink. Do you know, colleagues, when you talk of rethinking, if we are used to come in the office and sign attendance register, then you are Sebenza. But if I'm a figure to supervise our work, can you, can you rethink how you, you sign the attendance register? We'll fight, Yebana, because we are used to this. Change management, okay? it's not something that is very easy to implement. So we are saying when you are aligning this presidential youth employment initiative with our own education strategies, it makes us to rethink on how to implement human resource development strategies. When I'm talking about human resource development strategies, I'm not only talking to the section human resource. Other countries, human capital management, other countries like Lesotho and Zimbabwe, they say it's manpower management. How you rethink manpower management, it's something that this project here has given us as project managers, as a skill, because today you have to come up with new strategies and is strategies get the effect a lot of people and I think we are the biggest managed project because in our project we are more than 250 because those that are invi invited in this workshop Gabantu that are participating on day to day in the project so it's not going to be easy to implement then when you move get colleagues uh, to the implementation or oh, Albert Einstein get colleagues uh, I quote uh, in every crisis lies a great, a great opportunity. So we can never let a crisis go to work, to waste, sorry. If we're a good manager, every time there's a crisis, then you must learn something from that crisis. You cannot just say there was a crisis. So in COVID-19, to ask your colleagues, it was a crisis, but we can never let it go to waste because now we know that our project management skills is top up here and we can do, even if national, you've got uh, savings from other provinces, we can take them as the Eastern Cape because we know in every hour we want to learn. So we're looking at the public school, okay, colleagues, when you see this picture, okay, the picture that we have at the back of our mind, Indoba, 
kunje kwi public school but ke we want ke ngoku because we we indicated ke colleagues that one of our best strategies we implemented besides as our curriculum that are good it is this handyman project ye infrastructure you know you send cape gate department ya betwa kakhulu ku implementation of infrastructure projects but we are saying through the skills we are really we are hoping that uh, impact towards ensuring that is kolozwe to ziya beautify the desks ziya lungiswa and this project is a project yeah, that is going to be helping us so when you're looking at when you want to reimagine our infrastructure sifuna when you talk about maintained buildings and assets in our schools then get colleagues i think uh, when you're looking at the the objectives now of the training uh, we, we we did as i indicated get colleagues we achieved those traits uh, if you can move uh, to slide for five uh, training outcomes uh, with carpenters in all our regions we've got e plumbers bricklayers painters e amatailana and as you see get the trades in terms of the numbers per district and we were hoping get colleagues i know infrastructure is here there is a proposal that we brought as a province to oh, infrastructure when we are analyzing the budget that is sent to schools for maintenance we were saying gengoku to infrastructure we need to collaborate and uh, the budget that is sent to schools for 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 maintenance we ring fence it so that is schools they use these young people for e maintenance projects in the schools in that way get the project will be able to be sustained and will create a e job opportunities at a school level i know it's a debate that we have to take with our social partners but any investment on skills development as well as e trades once those a unemployed youth are not attached to his goal and into projects where they are going to accumulate e experience then it means this is going to be a fruitless expenditure so i think our colleagues as project managers when we engage our district heads as well as our schools we must looking we must be looking at the strategy of redefining the the, the maintenance budget for infrastructure with an aim of addressing these skill shortages uh, in our districts then I think, uh, colleagues, what we, you see the pictures, okay? the, it was taken from Lonoabo Primary School as Beleni, uh, EEAs, they were busy there, but Tengelupe into the school, and they did, they implemented this project, and also the benefits of the pro project, school plumbing, because what we did with the Border Training Center, uh, for 10 days they would do a theory, then after 10 days they go for practical. So in practical, that we made sure that they go to the schools and they really work on the ground as school, and, and we see the benefits of the project at a school level. Then, your colleagues, I will go to the challenges. I, I think the, the slides are a bit slow. Uh, I will go to the challenge, challenges, your colleagues, uh, of the project. I only have two. If you've got 10, it's well and good, but you are going to communicate those kind of sense one on one with the districts. Today, I indicated that we are only concentrating on what we are doing right as the province. I know that there are challenges, get colleagues. Uh, number one, uh, the data management system, we did not implement it fully in the province. Opelela, I know it's a, it's a problem. Once we talk of Pelela, uh, Wongumdu would want to go out of this. Uh, this hall. So, but KUTPE must know that because of the challenges, the connectivity challenges that we are facing in the province, we could not fully implement the project through Pelela, but there were other strategies that we employed as a project to ensure that we've got a data management system that is going to be able to account KUTPE on the numbers that we have account, that we have appointed. We used your SSMs, requested schools to capture on SSMs, but as we are moving forward, Ulenduka, 
or phase three, as a province who want to come back and be part, I mean, stay in line with other provinces, we cannot do away with Upelela, but we have to. It's an indication get to me as HRD that there is a skills gap for ICT in the province. So I must make sure that I train new project managers. Before you say Pelela is wrong, we are wrong. We don't understand Pesal, I mean Excel. So we project managers, they, do, they must be trained on Excel because Upelela has to do with spreadsheets because it's data management. Then one of our red flags in the province, care colleagues, was the issue of the delays in payments. Yes, we do. We, we, we manage to appoint on time as the province, but we delay to implement payments. And I think uh, once we focus Kakulu at appointing on time, as well as ensuring that Abantu Baya kept charge for payment, for phase three, we are not going to uh, carry the delays in payments uh, for phase two. Then I think uh, we recover strategy. As the province, we have, uh, through our internship program, appointed e audit champions. All districts are going to have e audit champions. Each circuit manager now is going to be working with an audit champion. We also have issued an advert through our skills levy budget that is going to be appointing e data capturers. So each circuit, again, is going to have a data capturer, and each district is going to have a dedicated team of data capturers because we've seen that without the data, we delay the payment, we delay the reporting. So that is the recovery strategy that we are bringing to phase three. Uh, also, okay, we are implementing on Persal, and I think when we were doing credentials, colleagues in the meeting, we indicated that we've got our deputy directors from finance and HR, they are here. Uh, we have uh, briefed them on how we want to implement phase three, and they are ready for the implementation uh, on Persal. We are finding each other, get colleagues with provincial treasury and OTP, because our management plan get, was sent and communicated to them. Uh, if functions for appointment have been released to the province, so we are not going to say in phase three, our treasury is failing to, to authorize for us. And also, get colleagues, we want also in phase three to strengthen the communication at, at school levels, second district offices, as well as head offices, Nagutipe we also have to strengthen our communication. When we have problems, UTPE must solve our problems because now the circuits and the districts, when they have problems, they expect me to solve their problems. So now I will just take the pro the second problems. This is said to the principals because UTPE was the principals there too. Also, okay, as a project, as we are moving forward, we want to work hand in glove with our, with our stakeholders. Uh, but, dear colleagues, I think on behalf of the project management team, I would like to thank the team from, from UDPE for their support and their guidance in the implementation of both phase one and two. Our second managers, I know the second managers, Ulukanyo, sometimes I'm called Miss Pelela, but ke, we are all working towards ensuring that this project is a success. When they are frustrated, if frustration is a misbelela, but it's fine because when you are a leader, you are able to take both the assets and liabilities of the project. So I cannot only be happy when you come to tell me good news. I must try to solve your problems. I think on behalf of the project, we also appreciate the district project teams, uh, the district directors, they are supporting, they've got a lot of work to do, but this project is very close to their heart. Our stakeholders, uh, NABO, we really appreciate them because they, throughout the implementation, uh, when we are not doing right, they always call us and Sibu sends it right. And the provincial project team, uh, thank you very much. That is the end of the presentation. Thank you very much. Once again, give Mamustia a round of applause, colleagues. Uh, th thank you so much. Uh, we've come now to the end of the second session, and it's time for discussions, questions, comments, and recommendations. There are questions for the six o'clock meetings. 
uh, we want the high level questions. Also, we need to have a cap and saucer approach. As you comment or you raise your question, you must also come up with a comment. Thank you so much. I'll start on this side. Are there any hands? No hands on this side. The second row, questions, comments. I'm moving on this one. The third row, questions, comments, recommendations on the presentations. Remember, we are looking on both first session and the second session. Eh? No comments. The fourth row, and the last row. Yeah, ask a cookie diesel. We've got one hand. Is there any other hand on the last row? Okay. You can also come forward if that mic is not working. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, th th thanks, Chairperson. Uh, firstly, I must appreciate the Department of Education by uh, taking this decision to have this workshop. Uh, my name is Mongiz Mashiyi, a provincial secretary for National Association of School Governing Bodies. Uh, I would first also thank for the presentations that sometimes are clear, sometimes are not clear. But I won't say all of them are not clear. Because at the end of the day, there are things that on this presentation that are going to bounce back on the ground, which is at schools and circuits. Uh, we have to, uh, we, as NACP, we have to come front and say, if things can be communicated proper, there will be no issues at schools. Because at the end of the day, those GAs and EAs I, I give, I will have a problem there. We don't want the situation whereby, again, this uh, presidential program that is being diverted to other things. When I'm saying it's diverted to other things, it's because it, 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 it caused a chaos. But this is a program that was, is a good program, but at the end of the day, we need it to, it must go forward. Why I'm saying so? If the, if the communication from the province states that there must be, something must be done on the certain date, then that communication must be, must be diverted. It must be the same communication to the school. We have seen some, some communication that are broken down on this, on this matter of EAs and GAs. That's why I'm talking about this. That is why we found us wanting, and as a National Association of Programming Bodies, have to take a stand to no department of education you are playing by this and also that makes the, our schools in in conducive situation